Carlson. Here. Vera. Menskako. Here. Hertek. Here. Goods. Miranda. Here. Citro. Here. We have physical one. Thank you very much. We are now going to go to agenda item number two. Oh. You're done. Pardon me, uh, Council. Uh, we were of the impression we weren't quite done with item number eight, which got bundled with item number one. Okay, I, I apologize, apologize if that's we had misunderstanding. Had, but please then proceed at your leisure. Yes, Gene Duncan, Administrator of Infrastructure Mobility. Uh, when we started out, I was offering to circle back on this part of the two uh, motions to see what your pleasure was after you heard about the process we're going to introduce with the biannual report. So now you've heard that and you've heard our comments and others' comments, so we just wanted to see what your pleasure was in terms of these additional um, hearings or approvals uh, in terms of projects of a certain dollar amount. Then I, the Councilman Carlson was about to make a motion. I asked him to hold it until the end oh. of the presentation. However, if you would like to go ahead and make your motions now, Councilman Carlson. Yeah, my answer to that is I think it's better to do both because then we have a lot of transparency. I thought the presentation was fantastic and it's nothing against anybody. It just allows uh, more time for the public. Probably 99% of them, it, it would just go through. But, um, and sorry to the clerk, I haven't written this down, but I'd like to make a motion to have uh, legal staff um, re, uh, return to council with a draft ordinance um, that would require contracts over $20 million to be um, discussed on the agenda two weeks before the vote to approve the contract. And I, and I need to pick a date, but I don't know what date. Uh, Morris, how, I mean, I don't know if I'll get the votes, but Morris, do you, um, is a month enough on that or? Um, at least 30 days would be helpful. Maybe if you wouldn't mind 60, but we Mark. can certainly prepare something and, and kind of what we were thinking, and we, we, we will we'll come back and talk to you about it when we have the draft, but the thought may be that there would be under staff reports a notice that we are coming forward with a proposed contract at the following hearing with attached to it the proposed contract so that it was on your agenda. You could discuss it under staff reports and then have the next two weeks the actual vote would occur on the resolution. Yeah, just so it's listed yeah. and then and then we would open it. I mean we don't have to open it, we just have a right. we can have a, a discussion. Correct. It's there, the public would see it and then we come back. Okay, sounds like we're on March second, is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. On March second. We have a motion made by Council McCross and seconded by Councilwoman Hertak. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Is there any opposed? All right, thank you everybody. Thank you, thank thank you. so much. Agenda item number two. Good afternoon, Council. Abby Feely, Deputy Administrator, Development and Growth Management. I have with me this afternoon J.C. Hutchinson, our um, building official. We did file a memorandum concerning item number two. We are available for any questions if you'd like to discuss that further. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, I think I made this motion. Um, I, I read the memo, but could you just for the public sake, 30 seconds, a minute, kind of summarize what, what you said? Sure. So the motion had asked um, on what to do about unpermitted structures throughout the city. And we did give um, a memo. Basically, it talks about the background of how unpermitted structures were originally handled. Um, prior to 2021, it was um, a coordinated effort between a little bit of code enforcement and a little bit of construction services. And then you may recall, um, we came as part of the budget to start what we refer to as the construction activity compliance team. And JC brought some changes related to chapter five and we brought that enforcement of illegal construction back to the construction services center. Um, the CACT through uh, a hotline hears complaints related to unpermitted work and they investigate those. Um, in the memo, I talked about that. Since we launched in 2022, um, they have performed uh, close to 2,000 complaint inspections and 73% of these inspections became formal violations. 
Um, so we start with that investigation, and then if it is determined that it is work without permits, they will issue a stop work order. If work then continues, um, JC as the building official has the right to cut the utilities to that building. Um, in order to no electric or water, we pull both those um, discontinuance of utilities. And then um, we also work on the enforcement of abandoned uh, structures with code enforcement, a neighborhood enhancement, and then also those go through um, the public, if they're a nuisance, then we work on nuisance abatement to get rid of those as well. A couple of numbers I didn't include um, in the memo is that um, currently in, in the first year, that January 2022 to 23, we collected close to $188,000 in um, stop work order fees and fines, and we collected 195000 in um, work without permits, fees, and fines. So this team has been working very diligently to bring that into the construction services. Ideally, our goal is to get those people who are out there performing this work without permit to get a permit so that we can then know that what they are constructing is safe and habitable if they're living in it or they're operating their business there. So. Um, that is where we currently are. I know through my one-on-one -on -one meetings with JC, we continue to look at how we can now, now that we have that team, it's working hard, how do we take that to the next level and continue the enforcement um, and, and really public education and getting out other information that can even take us further in this regard. So I, if, if I could just ask a couple, uh, follow up real fast. Um, the, um, I think the genesis of this was that we have so many cases, especially in West Tampa, where somebody's built an illegal structure and then they're coming out to the fact to get it approved. And um, kind of part of the question is how do, we, how do we address those before they come? Because it's difficult when we have to make a decision, it, especially if, if, if whoever built it sold it to somebody else, the new owner said, I bought it thinking all that was legal, I found out it's not, and then we have to tell them they have to kick part of their family out and tear down that building, or we have to allow somebody to get away with building a legal structure. So do you think that, that w what you said you're doing sounds terrific, but is, it, um, is, is that going to help solve that problem? And, and, and do you recommend any, or, any other ordinances, or is it just supporting your team and the budget for your team to enforce it? Well, I'll answer first, and then I'll okay. turn it over to JC. I think that um, you know, ultimately an illegal structure becomes legal if we get that after-the-fact permit. Um, but as part of that after the fact permit process, if it is not meeting certain zoning regulations or other regulations, then they do have to come in for a PD or a variance to get the setback adjusted. Um, ultimately, they'd have to take that first step and that decision does come to you and then it, it's up to you whether or not. I mean, our goal a lot of times is not to have them tear down the structure and I think very few of ours result in that, but it is to bring it into compliance and make it, it legal. I don't know necessarily at this time if we would recommend any other ordinances in relation to enforcement. I think it's going tremendously well. Um, and we've done even a series of uh, public service announcements, announcing the team, letting people know they're out there. Um, so that, that's my response, but I'll ask JC if he has anything he would like to add to that. Good afternoon, JC Hudgison, Construction Service Center Manager. Um, we would say probably some of that is, is that education piece to let people know um, what we're working with with some of the CRAs as well is, is kind of, a, you know, some, some simple questions to ask. Say, make sure that they have a, a, a building permit. Make sure they have a BLD. Starting to ask some of those questions up front because, yes, we do deal with a lot of those. It's been sold three times and they didn't know that it didn't have a permit. So then we're trying to work within the system to keep them compliant. So as, as Abby mentioned, a lot of those things kind of overlap. And so we try to work with them, you know, because we're not here to find them. It's to, to find the compliance. And so if we can find it, whether it is through a variance or something else. But with homeowners, a lot of them just don't know what needs a permit. So a lot of it is on the educational piece to say, hey, if you want to close in your, you know, your carport or you want to add this to your house, you need a permit. And it's just trying to trying to work with a lot of those groups and, and neighborhood associations to kind of get that information out there too. Because, you know, we get a lot of them, the influxes is usually after storms. When we have the storm season comes through and everybody comes in to say, hey, you know, I can, I can fix your roof for this or I can fix your, and we're like, 
no, you know, ask, ask some of these questions up front to make sure you've got a legit person out there um, doing work on your property. One final, final comment. Um, it, it seems like, I don't know what the, how many of these are in what part of the city, but it seems like a lot of the cases we get are in West Tampa, and many of them need interpreters, and, uh, and many of them are uh, kind of new immigrants. And so um, uh, to my colleagues who were experts on West Tampa, um, uh, you, you might get the communication department or whatever to talk to them about the special ways to, to get the word out um, to, to people who are new to the area or new to the country. Um, so that we can, and um, like in South Tampa, you might go to Home Depot, you know, whatever the equivalent is there that people are going to, to, to try to make sure people are educated along the way to make sure, because the worst thing is to have to tear, force something to be torn down after the fact. Thank you. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, one question, just overall, like a ballpark, how many people do we actually have to turn the electric or the utilities off for? I'm just wildly curious. We've only did it with four okay. so yeah. far in the last so year. We coordinate good. with um, TECO and we coordinate with the um, water department. And like I said, usually those are repeat offenders. We've given them a stop work order. They keep working on the property. They keep working on the property. Staff comes out there. We're saying, please stop working on the property. Come get a permit. They're still working on the property. Um, in, the, in the code, I have to give them 30 days. I have to give them an announcement after that time that they w we will then disconnect the utilities. But fortunately, we've only had to use that over the last year only four times. That's excellent. Um, I, the, I have heard you talk about the educating the homeowners. What are we doing to educate those who work on properties? And I know that can be hard to find because not all of those folks are licensed or, but, but how are we getting the word out to contractors and those types to say, hey, you know, come here first, we'll save you a lot of headache. Right now, um, we just have that initial PSA. We've been getting the work of the team really underway, but that's definitely something I think we could undertake here in the future very quickly um, with our communications team and get some other information out both on our website and on CTTV and other um, outlets to, to share that information. If you have other recommendations, I mean, JC um, does hold, we hold advisory group meetings every quarter. We have one for contractors. We have one for architects and designers. We have one for land use attorneys and consultants. And we share all of this information in our operations on an ongoing basis with those groups quarterly. Um, so I think that also is an outlet for how we're currently communicating um, what is going on and, and the services. And when we launched the CACT, I know that we did share that with those groups, which are the GCs and the others, but I know you're pointing out a gap. Those who are not licensed and may be performing the work. And in addition to that, the fraud hotline, which is part of this team, um, they, they did have cases that they took to court for people who were not um, licensed and were performing work. Great, great, thank you. That's kind of what I was looking for. But yes, I think we can always do better with that. Also in, I know we warn our homeowners that they need to get permitted work, but also the repercussions mm -hmm. is kind of a big deal. If you, if you don't get the work permitted, you're gonna end up spending a lot more money. Mm -hmm. um, but no, uh, I really appreciate that part. Thank you very much. Councilman Moran. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you for the work you've done and uh, the, the intense uh, effort to do what's right. The, um, the question about water and electricity hits me in the heart about uh, not the people, but do we know if there's kids living in that house? Do we know what the need is? Is the house vacant at that time? That's one thing. But if the house has got two or three kids, are we going to turn off the water and the electric? We've only done that on commercial. Yeah, it's operations. only been commercial property. So it's like a tenant space, tenant build out. No, if it's usually homes, we, we work with them. No, we, we understand that people have to live and, you know, so it's usually. I don't want to punish everyone for that's right. one, one misdoing. Correct. It's, 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 it's being on commercial two, use only. Do you have a, a, a system in place for court enforcement? And I have no beef with court enforcement. I think they do an excellent job. But most of these things are done Friday afternoon, Saturday, and Sunday. How many court enforcement officers are on the street on those days? 
Thank you for the answer. No, the, they're, they're not there on Saturday and Sunday, and that is something that, you know, we can look in at. In other words, what I want to do is prevent the ultimate from getting worse. Right. And if we don't change the system, it's going to get worse. So the system, in my mind, has got to be tweaked and changed. And in fact, I remember way back when some other administration wanted anybody that drove a city car that they saw something, they say some, saw something, say something. No one's ever done it that I know of. That's another problem that we have. So we're fighting an upstream battle to catch fish. And it's just, it's amazing that we're not working within our own system to, to, to solve the problem. This problem is more likely half and half. The thinking that they can't afford a, a permit, I don't know. The thinking that some friend's going to help them out, I don't know. The thinking that the system, they come from another city, who knows where they come from? Maybe where they come from the country, they don't need a permit. And they do that. And the language barrier is another one. I'm not saying that's relative in all cases, it may not be. So what I'm saying is, I think we have to clean ourselves up to understand the system better, to work to stop it before it starts. And we solve a lot of problems by doing that. But we're not doing that. It's like saying, well, the fire department's only going out where there's a five-story five building burning. You don't, they don't do that. They go out and check everything. I don't care if it's, you call them, they show up. Whether there's a fire or not, they try to make sure that that building's not going to burn. And we're not doing that here. We're not patrolling the streets. So, Councilman Marin, if I can just reply to that, I do want to say that prior to us consolidating and having this team, when code enforcement would cite someone for the work, it would take 21 days from the time the complaint was filed to the time the stop work order was being issued. And that's one of the reasons why we looked at this and brought it back into development services because we now can do it in a matter of days. So we have made that improvement. JC and I are also talking, gearing up for the budget for next year and looking at other alternatives about looking at staggered work schedules, having some of our inspections and other people look at uh, a Tuesday through Friday or Saturday and how we're going to continue to increase those services. So That's fine because the only thing I see here, we're not uh, proactive, we're reactive. And unless you change the system, when somebody moves in and you don't know when they move in or not, when they change the water, I guess, the bill, change, change the water building, that means somebody else moved in or the electric bill. Maybe we should send them a letter on things you can and cannot do in both languages. We're not doing anything to prevent it. We're going after, after the war's finished, we show up and say, here, I want to save you guys. It's too late. And most times you, you try to help them out. At that point, they started something. They don't have the resources to hire an engineer to give them a drawing of what you want. They got to tear the building down. And the losses to a, a young family or an older family or whatever family in today's society, I want to try to stop it before it starts. Understood. That's what I like to see. But thank you very much for your efforts and what you're doing. Councilwoman Hurtak. Uh, along those lines, thank you, Councilman Miranda, for bringing up the code enforcement part. Um, I was just at an Ybor City parking meeting where that was another thing to discuss. So I would love to bring that back to talk about code enforcement, being able to work 24-7 somehow, um, because as with uh, construction services, people will do things at all hours of the day. Um, maybe it wasn't a huge problem before, but now with everything that's going on in our city, how much we've grown, we absolutely need to look at um, some of these services happening all day, every day. So. Councilman Good. I've said that a long time ago. You recall a couple of times I went out on a couple of weekends where constituents called, and it was a holiday weekend, one weekend, and the guys were working. Um, you, you can't have the same playbook plays. You know, things change to get a different strategy. I'm glad you're looking at your, 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 uh, your budget. Um, but I, Mr. Miranda touched on something. You hear me say all the time, I said, you know, every employee in the city, your, your fire, your police, the ones that are driving those cars, if I can drive in my, in my district and I can go down 37th Street and I can see all this trash on the side of the roadway, 
and I can call it in, or I can take a photo and send it to CT. How, how, how can our other employees that are out there driving city vehicles, our trash, our trash pe our solid waste guys, they see more than anything. Well, you drive and you see houses that are abandoned. You know, why don't we have, again, some type of hang tag? Or you'd be able to call that in or, or have a number or have something to be able to put it on a system. Hey, this road has this and this, this, this try to trash. Or you see a dilapidated house that needs roof repair. You see an elderly lady out there sitting on the porch and her house is about to fall, but we don't call that in, but yet she don't know who to call for help. These are the things as a city that we have to be proactive to do versus the reactive when the house is falling down and the neighbors are down the street calling, hey, we got Miss Jones is nine years old and no one's trying to help her. But yet we drive down that street every day and see Mrs. Jones' house and no one's saying anything about Miss Jones. Same thing with the, you know, construction services. I mean, you know, uh, we see stuff, we don't see the signs that would have hurt. I can remember one time, Miss Miranda, uh, when I was a policeman, I didn't know you had to have a permit to do a roof. Didn't know that. So I, I hired a company to do the roof. So when I hired you, I hired you to do the pool, the permit, whatever was necessary. So they're working. A couple of days later, I get a notice on my door by the roof. I'm like, what are you talking about? I didn't know. So I think when we educate the public, because a lot of times the public don't know themselves, or the do's and the don'ts of what to do and how to do it. But I always say if they have some information or we see something, we can be able to give people information to call in. And I firmly believe that code enforcement hours should be changed a little bit uh, because things happen at night. That's why you have so much illegal dumping and stuff like going on. I mean, just one-on-one, -on -one. common sense to me. So, uh, you know, hopefully staff can look at those things and we re revamp some things we're doing to make a, a cleaner, better city. But appreciate what you've given us so far. In, in fact, there's another way we can send a message without very little cost or no cost at all. When we sent out the, the water bills, there's an insert in there. I, in 1974, there was only a postcard and a little stick. You took it off and you mailed it out, but the other side was blank. And we started a change, we put at least the emergency numbers behind that, and it worked, it helped a lot of people. And I, maybe we could suggest something to the administration, you guys are doing this, to put in both languages again, just a form letter saying, if you gotta fix your house, here's what you need to do, basic things, so that they at least have a number to call, so they can at least talk to someone. They don't know what they're doing. I'm not taking on their side, but on the side of being as, close to saying, you know, forgiveness is after the thought, but let's give them an, a, an avenue so that they don't have to be forgiven, that they realize what they have and they can fix it. If we can send something out, maybe in two languages, I'm not saying you've got to do that that way. However, you all think you run the department, we don't, but send it in with a water bill. The water bill, I don't think the cost is going to be anything increased, maybe a couple of cents if anything at all is already high enough, but when you send that, you can send another message inside that water bill. And that goes to a lot of people mm -hmm. in and out of the city. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. We can take that into consideration and working with the water department and see if we can work together and get it done. Thank you. Councilman Maniscalco. And real quick, because everything has already been said, but you know, I've gotten calls at 9 a.m. on a Sunday of illegal something in a house, in a single family home. And again, they don't know who to call, and I, and I tell them. I answer the call, and I start sending the emails. Usually, I send it out to John Bennett because, and I hate to bother him on a weekend, but he's, he's responsive, and, uh, you know, th there's, the officers aren't on the street working, and, you know, things get remedied the next day, the next business day. Another thing that was also brought up was, and somebody stopped me the other day, and they said, um, you know, I have city, city vehicles coming up and down the street, and there was... Uh, it was like furniture dumped somewhere, and they didn't do anything. They didn't do anything. So when we talked about a proactive approach, why, I don't know when the policy was initiated that, you know, if a, a code enforcement officer sees some, something that they, you know, put it in the system and, and whatever, I think that's, that's also helpful because uh, folks are frustrated. And, uh, again, everything else has been said, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Councilman Goose. Mr. Moran, you touched on something. You talked about that dreaded water bill. 
I may mention that a couple times about the water bill. See what happens with the water bill, and I talked to Chuck and about it before, is that you know they, they got to process how they process their water bill. But see, when you get the water bill, the first thing that a customer looks at, they don't look at nothing else. They want to see how much my bill is. The first thing you see, how much the bill is. And then everything else is thrown in the garbage. So I, I said, well, why can't we put the, 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 the amount of the bill someplace else other than the first thing you see, and that way people be able to read the information that's really important to the city because they got to get to it. But most people, when they open that bill up, they ain't looking at nothing. You just see that first top line, how much my water bill is, and the rest of it go in the garbage. And I can tell you, I've done it several times. So things are supposed to be inserted in there. I miss, ah, how much the bill is? Ah, okay. So you're right. You got to have a better way of communicating. The water bill could be a way. But that, that, that dollar amount can't be on the front page. It's got to be someplace else. Let me solve your, <laughs> uh, just one comment, I'll finish. Let me solve your problem. You can ask the water department to do what I did and tell them to take it out of your checking account or whatever it is every month, and you don't have to worry about it. Because one day I did the same thing he did. Then I got a bill and said, well, I know I paid it, and I checked. I had paid it. I had thrown it out. So I, I understand what you're saying. So from then on, I called him and said, just take it out. Take it out. <laughs> And, and I gave permission, it works perfect. But the water bill also contains a lot more information. Yes. It's also your garbage pickup. It's involved in yeah. it. there, There's a lot of things in there. But anyway, thank you very much. Anyone else? There, there, there are a lot of people out there that just don't know. Don't know what to do, and we've been discussing that. Uh, and, and information is key. And there are some people out there that are good people that just do bad things try and skate around the, uh, the way it's supposed to be done. I, I said this at the last budget hitting, hearing. We need more staffing. You go all the way from fire, police, code enforcement, inspection, permitting. The city is growing. We need more staffing. But getting back to those, those good people that just try and skirt the issue, code enforcement has a problem actually has two because now we're preempted by the state no one can call in anonymously and that scares people because their name is going to be on the record and they don't want whether it be their next door neighbor or someone down the street coming and harassing them for that code enforcement cannot enter a property that is fenced code enforcement cannot see something that may be happening behind that fence. So this, this is going to be an ever organic thing that needs to be taken care of. But Ms. Feely, thank you both for, uh, for giving this report today. Is there anybody in chambers that would like to speak to agenda item number two? Good afternoon, Keila McCaskill. Um, you know, that, that is something that comes up as a real estate professional. That's what I actually do. This is all uh, the center, so I'm volunteering. But as a real estate professional, one of the things I do when I'm looking at a home that has a lot of recent renovations is, as a professional, it's my duty to check for a recent um, permit. And so what I, maybe a nudge to real estate professionals to remind them, there's a lot. I know West Tampa, Seminole Heights. Um, and even some cases, and even in South Tampa, I've seen an influx of situations where they did not necessarily pull a permit. And sometimes the house has been sold two, three times. But as a professional, we should, as real estate professionals, that should be one of the first three things we check when they're actually interested in a particular property. My concern, though, in addition to that, is where the people did go through the process. I have some people, they hired a professional, they pulled an actual permit, and they received a new roof but the inspector that came out never got out the car. They inspected it from the car, and so days later, maybe I would say nine days later, Sears was hired to put on the roof for the senior. They put the roof on. Nine days later, they got a violation from code enforcement. The roofer never did the back of the roof. The actual order said it's gonna be $5,000. The actual bill came back $25,000, but they never covered the rear. And code enforcement saw the rear of the home. I don't know how they saw it, how they knew from the street what was wrong, but the inspector never got out of the car. And it, how we found out was the problem was they couldn't get homeowner's insurance. And that's from Tampa Heights to East Tampa. I've seen it, not the same roofer, but the same situation. And I'm not sure with the inspections if that's new. 
You don't have to get out your car to inspect the roof, but a lot of, they won't get on top of the roof at all to check it. They walk around the house if they do get out and some of them check it from in the car. And that's a concern for me as a professional, but then some of the people that they did call a professional, they did get an actual roof, but the actual inspector that works under the auspices of the city does not get out of their car. And it may have recently changed, I don't know, but I know that I have at least 10 examples of where they did not get out of the car or they did not get on the roof. They didn't even walk around the entire home to check the actual roof. And how we found out is either one, they couldn't get insurance, or two, code enforcement knocked on their door. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jim? Councilman Goods. Uh, JC, can you elaborate on that because I, I've seen that happen too, I, and what she's saying, is, I can validate, I've seen that happen. So is there a policy, or what is the procedure for the inspector? Uh, because it's not, I've, I've heard that more than once. Well, I, I'm, I'm not specifically familiar with that one. Um, what we've started to initiate lately is what's called virtual inspections by affidavit because of the, the, the threat of staff getting on the roof and hurting themselves. We provide a checklist that we then give to the roofer, and they have to give us pictures of all of those things. So if we need to see where the scupper is, we need to see that the drip edge was done correctly, they take pictures of each of those, and then we review it from the, from the car. And if we need to get out, then we will get out, but we'll have the pictures to tell us what we need so staff doesn't have to get on a roof. So ideally, I can get that specific one from her and, and follow up on that one specifically, but over the last... Uh, six months we've specifically done that just to reduce liability to staff and to make sure that we're we are covering all of those because when it does get to an argument with insurance or something like that we have photo documentation that the roofer installer himself is put is on the record and we can review it all right thank you from the this is just the first thing that popped to my mind how do we know it was the roof in question so when we do it we tell them to take a picture from the street so they have to confirm that that's the house. They have to have the, the, um, the address in the, in the picture. So we, look, we ask for a series of photos, and then we confirm it, and it also has to be date stamped. So they can't just take a picture and just submit the same one up under each roof. So we, we check for that, and like I said, we review the plans. We see the, the roof plan of what and the limit of what's being done. So therefore, then the checklist, and I can provide to you all what that checklist is, and that's what we look for for the, um, the documentation. Uh, I mean, I understand that we are understaffed and we we need to use technology um it really that does make me uncomfortable but i was asking or I, i'm curious if there's possibly a way that if everybody who goes through that do you by chance like randomly decide to say pop on to a roof randomly exactly. that even though they get the photos you're like well you know i'm just going to pull this one out of a hat today and actually go inspect it myself well, staff still has to physically go to the site. So even though we have the virtual to get the pictures, that's the that's the preventing the staff from having to be on the roof. But we check them all. We have to. Okay. So Thank it's you. not that they get away. They, they can do that, and then we don't have to check it. We still have to check it. So it just keeps staff from getting physically having to get on these roofs because the liability of ladders, somebody falling off the ladders and all of that. So staff, like she says, that they may go to the to the residence and drive off. It's because they're going to the residence, they're checking the photos that have been provided, what's been uploaded to the record, the affidavit that has been installed correctly, and then that's where we go from there. So like I said, if they do see a discrepancy, they can fail it there because they're at the site. It wasn't like we never went. So like I said, we're, we're able to cover that base as well. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Agenda item number three. Thank you, Abby Feely. Um, agenda item number three is a motion that was made in relation to the city's green building ordinances. Um, much like a recent presentation I made to you uh, collectively with Vic Vide and Whit Reamer on um, EV parking and charging um, here today with Witt and JC to give you a um, overall presentation on our green building initiatives ordinance. Um, the city's, and can you bring up the presentation please? Thank you. Um, the city's original green building ordinance was passed in 2008. It was done to encourage resource conservation reduce the waste generated by construction, increase energy efficiency, and promote the health and productivity of residents, workers, and visitors. And today we're gonna to discuss um, the historical background, our current code, um, incentives uh, that we have, as well as incentives in other cities, and then some recommendations that we have for you. Um, one thing t council touched on already this morning that's very much the fact is why I brought this up, that our green ordinance was in 08, 
is that times change, technology changes, growth patterns change, um, the ability to use other appliances or solar or all these things change. Um, in fact, recently there was a building code change that now only requires a certain air conditioning sear to be used that builders can no longer use a lesser sear. So all these things are changing and um, that's where some of our recommendations come into you today on what's kind of brought us forward from 2008 now to 2023. And um, we are gonna cover, next slide please. Sorry, this was just the motion. Oh, do I need to do it? Got it. Um, here were the motions. Uh, the motion that was made and we have been working to uh, come together and work on this um, both from our sustainability and resiliency side with WIT as well as our construction side with JC in order to provide a comprehensive approach to um, what's going on. We're going to talk with you today about the green fast track program, um, incentives to encourage sustainable construction and then city funded construction and renovation. And I'm gonna turn it over to Wit and then um, JC, and hopefully this won't be too long and we'll uh, cover some good information for you. Thanks, Abby. Uh, uh, afternoon, Chair, uh, Council members. So I'm gonna talk about um, the current green fast track program. I'm gonna talk about city funded projects and the requirement for uh, green um, LEED silver certification and then uh, the ordinance with relation to uh, the incentive. So the Green Fast Tech Program, uh, this was an administratively created kind of worksheet that has been around for many years. Uh, I think my, my predecessor, uh, Tom Snelling, probably worked with the building department to um, put this together. And it's a, it's a checklist that you can go in and provide alongside your permit application. There are two paths that uh, a applicant can pursue. One is for commercial structures out of over 5,000 feet, and that those require third-party certification. Uh, that would be, um, in this instance, the Florida Green Building Coalition or the U.S. Green Building Council. Uh, for uh, commercial projects under 5,000 square feet and for residential homes, uh, there's kind of a self-reported checklist and you can go and check. I have energy efficient windows. I have low uh, flush appliances. Uh, and the point of doing this, is, is the idea of creating this, this, this program was to expedite permit processing. Um, after a review of the utilization of this program, uh, we found that it, it's, it's not uh, used really at all. Um, and we've kind of struggled to determine the exact reason for that, but, but I think the reason uh, that we're really happy to, to, to report today is because JC and his team are actually already pretty quick at providing um, those first round of comments and, and processing the permit. So there's not really an incentive for builders to go through this laborious checklist or go pay for the third party certification when there's really no incentive because we uh, are, are so expeditious with our permitting here at the city. So kind of um, uh, so a good news story to report there. Uh, just some numbers to that. Uh, I think JC and his team, 90% of their residential permits are being returned for first round comments within 10 days and uh, on the commercial side within 15 days. Uh, the other kind of compounding factor is there's a state law that requires his shop to turn around comments 30 days for residential and 120 days for commercial. So again, this was, I think, probably a, a good idea when it was created, probably when that shop uh, wasn't processing applications maybe as fast, given the technology that's come alongside of Excella. So uh, th that, is, that is the Green Fast Track program in a nutshell. Uh, the second um, kind of green building incentive program that I wanted to raise to your attention is found in Chapter 17, and this was put into place in 2008 by ordinance, and this requires all city-funded construction to uh, pursue LEED silver certification unless uh, there's some type of administrative determination that uh, doing so would be cost uh, ineffective. So. Uh, there hasn't been prior to, and you saw the grade eight this morning, uh, a lot of new construction of city buildings in the last decade, but we're, we're doing a lot of that now, and I'm happy to report that ordinance is finally working. Uh, you know, we applied it to Hannah Avenue. Hopefully, we're going to get well above LEED Silver, uh, but that'll be a minimum requirement that was put into the original RFP. 
um, for for any construction or um, a substantial renovation, and that usually triggers at 50% uh, of the of the building uh, for for lead silver or an equivalent standard. Um, we're also per, uh, pursuing lead silver at the East Tampa Rec Center. And again, this is just kind of getting ahead of these projects. And ultimately, if we're using city funds, we want to make sure that we're providing energy efficiency, which saves money in the long run. And of course, happy uh, uh, places for people to work, live, and play, healthy and happy places for people to work, live, and play. Uh, finally, I want to touch on uh, part of that ordinance that is probably one of the most powerful ones, but is least utilized right now. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about why. Um, this is this is section uh, 17.5.204, and it establishes a process for partial rebates for permit fees. Um, importantly, this relies on annual uh, budget appropriations, and unfortunately, we can't use construction enhancement fees to fund that. Uh, based on our research, since this has been uh, in ordinance since 2008, uh, no administration has ever proposed it in a budget to be funded, and uh, I don't think that city council has Pardon me. Everybody good on their phones? Thank you. Uh, so the way this program works is for single family homes or major modifications, uh, you can pursue a Florida uh, Green Building Coalition green home standard, and that will enable you 50% rebate. Uh, this is a program that is kind of analogous to LEED and USGBC, uh, and we'll probably talk a little bit more about uh, 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 our relationship with that group and how we, we don't think that's maybe as an effective uh, certifying agency as, as USGBC. For a new commercial or multifamily residential, some pretty significant rebates here. If you um, uh, pursue LEED platinum certification, 80% of your rebate, 60% at gold, 40% at silver, and 20% for certified um so you know for some of the bigger new construction you could have several hundred thousand dollars in permit fees and uh so this could be a real incentive for folks to, to spend a little bit more money on uh, the lead certification again for those that aren't familiar lead is leadership and energy and environmental design and it's a very strict robust protocol that goes above and beyond uh the base building code uh, florida has an incredibly strong building code and we're going to talk a little bit about why we're kind of concentrating on the commercial side rather and the multifamily residential rather than the single family residential uh, in the next part of the presentation which my colleague jc will cover Good afternoon again, J.C. Hutchison, Construction Service Center Manager. Um, so since um, we started the research here for the Acela system and going through to confirm what's what's LEED certified and what isn't. So um, based off of the USGBC, uh, United States Green Building Council, there's 302 buildings in the Tampa currently that are at least LEED certified. So for us, it's, it's good that people are doing this without being coerced. We're not, we're not even adding, you know, necessarily advertising the um, rebate as much. And we still have 302 buildings over the last, uh, I believe it's 10 years? 10 years. The last 10 years that, that have gone through this. And Actually, you can, that's total. Total? That's okay. Total. And so as you can see, you have Sky Center, Metropolitan Ministries, so different sizes and scales of projects that are, that are at least being um, city, um, U.S., um, LEED certified. Um, one of the things we also did, I reached out to um, the building officials and um, development groups in other jurisdictions. Just, you know, we just say, hey, are you, what are you doing? We were just curious to see. Um, so the only two cities that we know in the Bay Area with uh, Largo and St. Petersburg provide a bonus density if you use LEED green building, but most other jurisdictions don't. Now, the, the tie there is with the building code. Um, technically, per state statute, I have to issue the building code and the same permit fee for everyone. So I can't provide a discount to provide someone else. So most times when I contact the building departments, they don't have any green initiatives there because state law won't allow us to provide a discount at that time. Um, so the recommendations, um, sunsetting the fast track program. Um, some of that is to evaluate, to look at it, to make sure that, you know, are we reaching the right group? Um, is that coordinated? Can it be coordinated better? Um, as, as Whit mentioned, revising Chapter 17, just trying to make sure that's, that's better spelled out. And obviously, as we've done this research, and as I just mentioned, we have to provide an allocation somewhere. So there will be a request to, um, in the current budget, for an allocation to have money for that. Because like I said, as a state, when we issue the permit fees, I can't, I can't take out of that money to provide a rebate back. I have to have a fund to be able to do so. So we think a lot of times we've had 
uh, not a lot of buy-in to it is because there was never a fund set aside to do so. It was, it was put in the code to do it, and then it was just never funded. So we believe adding these three things together will be able to provide us um, a way to be able to um, further incentivize these options. And we'll take any questions. Councilman Maniscalco. I was wondering, on new construction, what does our code say, if anything, regarding uh, any requirements on electric vehicle charging stations? I don't know if this has been brought up Let's, before. Electric Let's vehicle charging stations. Um, Abby Feely, I'm sorry. That's going to be coming back before you in the January text amendment cycle um, based on the workshop we did a few months ago okay, okay. in requiring that. We weren't going to require it for single family detached homes, but no, we no. did have other requirements, and those will be coming back before you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I just got a couple quick questions to, very quickly. Are there any other cost neutral incentives that could be considered instead of partial? permit rebates, i.e., uh, don't density bonus, uh, bonuses, reduction of impact fees, expended permitting, expedited permitting. Uh, and how is, this, how is this program that you're just talking about now going to be tracked? Will we be able to give us quarterly reports on how well it's doing? Oh, sure. So a uh, part of the Acela system, one of the updates is to, for the when you're the applicant is to say that I am applying for a lead. So then therefore, from that point forward, we'll be able to track it. We won't have to go to a separate site. We can pull per the month, per the week, per the year, and we'll be able to provide that information back to you. Right now, we kind of have to search and do another level of search. It literally has to be in the summary that they, you know, you're telling us the scope of work, and then we're doing a keyword search, which is a lot harder. So now it'll be separated as a separate box. You check the box. Similar to that, we have one for affordable housing. If it's affordable housing project, it gets a check. So then we know, like I said, we make sure we stay on top of our timelines to provide um, service on those. And just to add on that, and then what we do is we run reports on that. So we'll be able to tell you, and that's, that's how we know right now how many new multifamily units came online. How many of those multifamily units were affordable? We'll do the same thing. The, the goal per our discussion was, um, you know, we realized this had not been funded. Um, and so working together and, and going back to the administration to inform them and then looking at funding it for the fiscal year 24 budget. Um, and then how would that work? So if we were going to start with the request for the 500,000 that would be 250,000 for commercial and 250,000 for multifamily and it is a first come first serve within a period of time of that building getting CO they have to get their certification and come back to us and then they would receive the rebate the rebate would be up to $25,000 of their permit fee. It would go based on those percentages and their certification with a maximum of 25,000. Based on the 500,000, that could yield us potentially 20 new projects a year that would be able to facilitate using this project, using this program. So that's where we are right now in the midst of starting to construct that and put that together in a way um, that it would fall into the fiscal year 24. Councilman Miranda. Just one last thing, if I may. Just, I'm just picking out of the box, and any one of you three maybe can uh, help me on this. What a, in any construction that is going on, uh, how can we facilitate and put solar into the mix where the developer or the homeowner can put solar and get a rebate of some kind, like what they do when they build the bonus provision, when you're building something and so forth and so on? Is there any way of doing that? Uh, sure. So uh, thankfully, um, uh, last November, uh, the U.S. Congress passed the unfortunately named Inflation Reduction Act because um, it, it doesn't really uh, reflect all the all the great uh, green uh, and clean energy, renewable energy provisions that are in that bill. But uh, the, the, the best way to encourage solar right now is through that 30 percent tax uh, credit that's available through the, the through the federal government. We also, and I'm actually uh, happy that you brought that up because um, I wanted to um, bring in our colleagues from the Solar United Neighbors, who uh, uh, Councilman Miranda facilitated the solar on your house. Uh, they want to do a report for their latest co-op uh, and provide you guys some numbers for what their goals were getting solar uh, in here through the co-op model in Tampa. So there is a financial incentive available through the federal government. In terms of the building code, um, you know, 
Florida has a very, very strong building code with regards to energy efficiency. And uh, that's, that's very helpful for new construction and retrofits. You know, the, the best thing that we can do to reduce energy is, is, is through energy efficiency. Uh, and then once you've done all that, putting solar on is, is, a, is a great next step. Um, but can it be done? FAR, when you're building something, you ask for a, a bonus. Can we supplement solar for a bonus? So right now, um, I was just actually working with the Planning Commission last Friday afternoon about um, the bonus density and, and what we're doing and how we're going to move forward with that as part of the plan update. Because um, as you know, right now, the state, um, state requires, we have a gray water bonus. Um, and we did uh, used to have lead as an option. It wasn't specific to solar, but it was specific to lead. So we are currently in those discussions um, and looking predominantly at restructuring our bonus to be supporting and, and promoting affordable housing. That is first and foremost. And, and there's uh, several branches to how that's happening right now in that discussion. And I'm actually going to have a follow-up with Melissa Zornita um, next week to, to talk about that structure, what that means. So environmental. Um, we do, we have talked about sustainability and resiliency, which would include that, and I will definitely keep it at the top of our discussion. And, and Abby, thanks again for bringing up affordable housing. That's a great way of reducing somebody's payment on the house because it's something less that they have to deal with. Right. And, and it, it, just, uh, it just helps people that really want to help themselves and can't, but reducing that would certainly help a lot of people. Well, I know that on one of our houses from Infill One that Habitat worked on, they did a partnership with a solar company. And I believe um, there's two numbers popping in my head right now. One is $4 and one is $11. But I believe the homeowner's electric bill ended up being um, $11 a month um, with the solar installed. Um, and then that was their water heater, their air conditioning, everything. everything. So there is, but that I know was a partnership because, of course, when you're building affordable, you're trying to keep those costs lower. So, but I will definitely incorporate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Ms. Feely, if I may, Whit, have you briefed the rest of the council members on this green team? Uh, I don't believe we've had a chance to do that. Can we've you been... briefly just tell us? Tell us about it, just briefly. Sure. Uh, last week, we launched the City of Tampa's Green Team. This is a, a partnership that was funded through Volunteer Florida and AmeriCorps. Uh, it's a three-year program. Uh, for this first cohort, we've hired uh, or uh, partnered with 20 part-time uh, members to serve in the community, uh, to tackle litter, to plant trees, engage in beautification, clean up our stormwater infrastructure. Uh, an incredibly diverse group of people. Hundreds of people applied to join us. Uh, and they're paid a living stipend, uh, and, and this is, again, facilitated through an AmeriCorps grant. We are the first environmental stewardship city-sponsored program in the state of Florida. Uh, they were really, really excited. In fact, Miami called me last week and said, you know, how did you guys pull this off? It's so cool. Uh, and so we're going to be doing this for three years. You're going to see people out in green shirts around the community, picking up trash, planting trees, making sure the stormwater infrastructure is cleaned up. And this was kind of a quick way to get people engaged, but also to help uh, address those issues that you guys get calls on, I think, a, a lot. So we're really, really excited about that program. And, and thanks for your support um, and, and uh, facilitating that grant. Thank you very much, Wiz. Council, if I may, very quickly before you move on to your next item, um, I believe there was a memo that um, asked if we could come under staff reports on the 2nd to discuss with you $800,000 the city's receiving from the federal government in what are rush funds, and these are to help homeless um, with rapid rehousing. This was an allocation that came. It does not require public hearing or anything like that, but we would like to come under staff reports on the second and provide you um, with some information concerning that um, allocation that's come from HUD. Second. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Carlson. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, on agenda item number three, is there anybody in chambers who would like to speak to agenda item number three? Seeing none, Chief Tripp, Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Agenda item number four. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Council. Chief Tripp, Tampa Fire Rescue again. Um, of course, based on this agenda item, the discussion was um, to give information concerning communication whenever there's an emergency within the city of Tampa. So with that, um, emergency preparedness pretty much follow up on the emergency management, which is done in my portfolio. And of course, I have the emergency management department, which is um, uh, my emergency management coordinator, John Antaphasis, who's going to kind of outlay some of the communication that we do through all of the city employees, including you all, as well as the community. So we have some handouts, so you can go along. We have a slide presentation. So we're going to hand these handouts to you so you can um, There we go. So I'll let, um, like I said, emergency manager coordinator John and uh kind of review all of the communication that we have. Okay. Good afternoon, council, public, John and emergency coordinator with City of Tampa. Um, wanted to give you today a quick overview of our procedures for communicating with U.S. City Council during emergency incidents. Obviously, we had Hurricane Ian last year. That was the last time I spoke in front of you about a week before it made landfall back in southwest Florida. Um, but real quickly, just wanted to give a quick overview of our division within Tampa Fire Rescue and how we get our communication methods through our different agencies. And then next few slides, I'll show how we communicate directly to you at, as city council when we get that information. Uh, Office of Emergency Management, we're a small division in Tampa Fire Rescue. There's four guys uh, as part of our team, but as a small team, we are very mighty. We work with all levels of government, all our departments within the city of Tampa because everyone has a role during an emergency and we have to ensure that we're prepared to respond to those emergency situations when they do occur. Um, but also as part of our team, our duties are that one of us is on call 24 seven each week and there's a rotation schedule that goes on there. We call it the emergency management duty officer. So on that week at any given time, that individual is monitoring communications that we get from Hillsborough County, state of Florida, different agencies within the state, as well as our departments of any emergency situations. Day to day, we're getting messages from motor vehicle accidents, hazardous materials incidents, environmental incidents. These are going on constantly. Throughout the day, our phones get beeps and pages for emergencies at a lower level that don't necessarily need to be communicated out to all our stakeholders. But that is continuing, to, uh, that is always being monitored. On the right side of the presentation, you do see we have these different agencies that we get information from, whether it's severe weather from the National Weather Service, street flooding from Tampa Police Department, water main breaks from the Water Department, infectious disease back in COVID-19, we work very closely with the Department of Health. All that data and communication is funneling through our division, and then we have to analyze that to say when it, it's going to uh, be expanded out and need to be communicated directly with our stakeholders and then ultimately to City Council. So our severe weather briefings, you should have received one yesterday. We had one go out for the cold front that was coming through uh, late evening yesterday, as well as the cold temperatures that we're expecting tonight into tomorrow morning and then into tomorrow night as well, as well as those cold weather shelters that are going to be activated. We routinely get these severe weather briefings from the National Weather Service and we communicate those out. Our basic threshold in our procedure is anything at a marginal risk or higher. So the National Weather Service does have six levels. Level zero is a thunderstorm threat. We don't necessarily push those out. Anything from marginal risk of up for severe weather, we're gonna go ahead and send out those briefings and you would get those via email from us. The next product that we also send out to city councils is our situation report. So now this is at a point where incident, um, we're taking special consideration of what's going on. When we were going through COVID-19, you were getting situation reports daily from us on the, the trends, the data that we were getting from the state, the protective actions that were being taken from the city, county, as well as our state agencies as well. But again, this document is set forth to 
one, document the actions we're taking as a city for historical purposes, whether if it even escalates further and we become a presidentially declared disaster, and we need to have that documentation of the actions we're taking at the city, but also for situational awareness. All the different departments that we work with, all the different agencies, levels of government, we wanna make sure we're capturing what's going on. So there's more effort that goes into these situation reports um, maps, data that we're collecting, any additional forecasts. If you remember before Hurricane Ian, we're constantly getting updates to the track, the intensity, and where that landfall was gonna go for that storm. As that information is updated and given to us, we'll incorporate that into that situation report as well. Um, we also, again, work very closely with all our departments. Although we're embedded in Tampa Fire Rescue, we work with mobility, we work with Tampa Police Department, code enforcement, there are different roles during an emergency situation, but these situation reports, we take information through our WebEOC platform, which is an application we use for information management, collect what activities are going on throughout the city, compile that into this report so we're getting you the, the latest, greatest data. Next slide, please. Our warning and notification system, you may have heard of it um, as Alert Tampa, but Everbridge is the application that launches those messages that go out. Um, we, one, internally, we internally use this communication method, one in departments, but also we have a, set, a group set up for city council as well that we can blast out within, it, within an instant through your cell phone, text message, email, and get pertinent information to you very quickly. And we set up that group ahead of time, again, to be prepared that if any messages that administration wants us to, to launch, we can do that very quickly through that application and actually through our smartphones even. We have an application to get those messages out. Each year we do an annual test of that system. You all were included in that in May of last year. We hit 4,800 plus employees to ensure that they are receiving those messages. If they don't, they have one other, op they have one other opportunity to confirm they've received that that next week. If they don't do that, they get followed up with their supervisor. So we have that know your role program within the city that everyone has an emergency function during an emergency. So this is our main activation met method to get that activation out. When we set up shelters for Ian, we use this application to activate those personnel, get them where they need to go. The emergency operations center, when it activates, same thing. We'll use this method to activate the emergency operations center. As we're anticipating for Saturday with Gasparilla, we will have the emergency operations center activated. We use this application to activate it and communicate that to all the stakeholders and personnel that are working that incident. Mm -hmm. um, that's the last one on that one. And then just finally, um, just as, as, a th as a big message for the public, Alert Tampa, if you're not enrolled to it already, please enroll to it. It's going to be our direct method from the city to communicate with the public as well. Um, Gasparilla is coming up this Saturday, and if you want to be in the know on those messages, if you haven't been receiving them already, text the word Gasparilla to 888-777, and you'll know all the activities that are going on during the event. But during an emergency, that is also the software that we'll be able to get out messages quickly to the public if there's any shelter in place or any other emergency notifications that need to go out to the city. Yes, and I think I made the motion on this one. Um, I think the announcements that you and your department do are excellent. Um, <coughs> during the hurricane, we get, uh, what is it, twice a day, yep. detailed updates of everything that's going on, and we probably all read that. Um, I personally sign up for the Alert Tampa. The communication department sends us um, infographics of, um, to, to help the public know how to sign up for alerts and, and other kinds of announcements. The, <clears throat> the issues, there are a few issues that, that I face, especially in the last one, and I don't know about my colleagues, can't talk about it outside of here, but, um, and I won't get the timing exactly right, but um, it was like, what it was a Friday morning or something that Ian hit, and uh, I can't remember the day, maybe Monday, whatever the day it was. Um, like starting around eight o'clock in the morning, I was talking to people in the county, and they said, by the way, we're gonna be shutting down most of South Tampa within the next couple hours. So I waited about an hour, and I didn't hear anything, and then I called chief of staff, or I texted them, I can't remember, and, and then an hour or two, I think he was going to a meeting like an hour or two later, um, I got a heads up that yeah, they were shutting down most of South Tampa, and it was, what is it, section two, and then l later they did section three. Well, the practical thing for me is that my kids were in school, and they're in that zone, uh, what, no, zone A and B, sorry. Um, and 
and my house is in, in zone A. And so um, looking at the waves, uh, my house would have been, even though it's pretty high up, like 15 feet below water if the, if the whole thing fit like that. So personally, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, how do I get my kids safe? How, what do I do in my house? So I don't, have any place to, I don't have any place to go, then I have to find another place to locate. At the same time, city council member, and uh, you know, people who are up in drier land, they can, they can figure out what to do. I think Councilmember Citro lives in a condo in uh, Bayshore, so he has the same problem. But um, we, um, we um, <laughs> yeah, you can go surfing downstairs. Um, but uh, we, the, the question was, um, first, I, I think there should be a protocol outside of the standard things. Um, and if you think of us as the legislative arm of the city, um, just like, and, and sorry to make this comparison, but just like Congress has an emergency place to go, emergency meetings and everything, if we're thinking about worst case scenarios, a couple of these hurricanes like Charlie and Ian, we thought that, I, I thought it might come back to have everything in my neighborhood, everything south of Gandy for sure, completely wiped out. I mean, if you see the pictures of Katrina, South Tampa could end up like Katrina. And by the way, since Stephanie's back there, I should say my, um, Legislative aide lives right by Big Dill. It took her it, before the announcement was made because I was talking to her about it. She jumped in the car immediately to leave. It took her 30 minutes to get from kind of the McDonald's by McDill to uh, Target, which usually is five minutes. And this is what people have been talking about about the evacuation. That's before anybody knew about it yet. Nobody, the public didn't even know. And so one thing is, I think there needs to be a, a special, there needs to be some kind of special protocol for, for big disasters. You know, if it's going to be cold this weekend, that's one thing, but big disasters that does, that in this case, it can completely wipe out my district. It could, my district could have been completely underwater. It could have looked like uh, New Orleans after Katrina. And it, that happens about every 10 years we get a threat like that. So it would be nice to have some kind of special briefing, some kind of special, um, uh, communication, and I guess that would go to the citywide folks as well. Maybe we could jump on a call where we couldn't talk to each other. I don't know, but we need to know uh, what what's happening other than the information that's readily available. And sometimes I was getting information fact faster by watching Twitter from other government agencies. Um, I think I mentioned uh, St. Pete was putting some stuff out a, an hour or two before we do. We did, so I was able to see some of the things that were going on. Um, so one is special kind of communication, because we have a responsibility to keep the city going. Number two is, um, and, and, uh, related to that, uh, we have to be one of the first and best sources of information also. And uh, the communication department did send us things, they did post stuff, but we need to make sure that communication line is clear and that we're letting people know as early as possible. Like everybody wants to know when, when, the, when the hurricanes passed over, they want to know when can they come back. And then when's the trash going to be picked up? When's the roadside? So all of that, the faster we can get it out, the less people are worried about it. And, and, and they look to us to answer those questions. So the faster we get it and the faster we can post it, then, uh, then, then the better the information gets out. The other thing is um, what's the protocol for what we're supposed to do? Uh, you know, if we do certain things, uh, people might say, oh, you guys are doing that because it's politically uh, uh, you know, something that you can show off doing or whatever. Um, uh, uh, you know, you, you can think about the, the kind of photo ops. But in reality, uh, if, if a catastrophic disaster hit Tampa, remember what we had to do with COVID where we had to go locate at the convention center? If, knock on wood, if something catastrophic happened, how do we, how do we reform the government? Where are we supposed to be? And, um, and then the, the chair went to the... EOC building, if something happens, to, and I'm sorry to bring all this up, if something happens to the mayor, he's the mayor. And so is it make sense for them both to be in the same room at the same time? I presume that the seven of us are not supposed to be there because then the government would be knocked out. But what's the, what's the pro, and, and maybe you all don't have the answers today, but what's the protocol for city council? Where is city council supposed to be? How are we supposed to be reachable? In a, in a catastrophic event, sure, the, the mayor has special powers. Uh, but at a certain time, that, that goes by, and you need access to city council. And so I, I wish there was some kind of super emergency protocol so we would know what to do and where to go and how to communicate so that we can not only communicate with our constituents, but keep the government moving in a, in a special disaster. Thank you. Can Councilman Matt I just wanted to say thank you for all your work, and I'll tell you why. 
I signed up with Alert Tampa and I get the notifications and the phone call. Um, the situation reports that you send out are extremely helpful um, to keep me updated of what's coming, you know. Um, Councilman Carlson did touch on a lot of stuff and he is, his district is the most vulnerable because, you know, you see the, the sea level there and, and everything. Um, I remember when Irma was coming the Friday before it arrived, and as downtown was being evacuated, I went around town and I took pictures of all the places that I like because I said, this is it. And I got a call from somebody in the administration and they said, hey, we're here for you, Councilman, if you need anything. And I said, I have a bad feeling about this. And he goes, yep, you're, uh, you know, we're in the same boat. If you need us, we're, we're, we're here. But luckily we were spared. You know, when I saw the water being pulled out of the bay, uh, I said, you know, what's coming back is going to be what we cannot imagine. And again, I said everything that we love and, you know, parts of the city were going to be wiped out. However, we were spared that and even with Ian most recently. But getting back to the point here, I think how you uh, send out information is very effective. Uh, people get it. Social media is very powerful. I like to share as much as I can with, with people, whether it's helpful or whether people see it or not. But you know, emergency numbers, what to do, sandbag locations, on and on and on. I, uh, I think it's, it's a great system. However, we can improve um, in areas that we need to. Council Member Carlson mentioned, you know, the gridlock, you know, when people have to evacuate. Um, you know, South Tampa is not super manageable to get out. I mean, yes, we have Dale Mabry, we have Gandhi and whatnot, but when you have mass panic, essentially, uh, everything comes to a standstill. So thank you very much for everything, sir. Councilman Goods. You know, the information is good, but Councilman Carlson touched on it. There's a missing piece. This council is a part of this government, mm -hmm. and we're left out of the process. You look at the county commission, when they have an emergency over there, all of, every commission is notified personally of what's going on all the time. We aren't. We're not notified. I found out about Bayshore, uh, South Tampa power may be cut off. People were calling. I didn't know anything about that. I think that's something that the council members need to know if this city is going to go up, go black. Uh, it's, it's like uh, Ms. Carlson said, if something does happen, how does this council communicate or how, how are we notified? You know, that's nice that John Bennett gives us a little text here and there, but I, I think there's a, there has to be another process in place for this government. Because there is two sets of government here, and we need to be notified of what's going on in real time, not after the fact or sometimes in between. Um, I thought at one point we had asked for a possible tour of the EOC building, because some of them haven't even been in that building. We still haven't got that tour yet. Uh, Can I? So, go, Chief. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, I think it was something from the attorney telling me that. Um, when I invite you, I, I, I don't know the laws behind inviting you all over, but like I said, I'll send him an email and we can schedule something for you all to go over to EOC. I, I think that'd be fine. And there is sunshine, but we've gone places before where we've had the camera, we've had people to take notes or what have you. You know, uh, things can be uh, accommodated. Uh, yeah. Mr. Shelby gets kind of spatic sometimes with making sure we follow rules, but we can follow rules. But I think things, these things that this council, maybe future councils coming aboard should know and be aware of, but I think we have to fill in a gap, and there's a missing gap, and I think we need to look at that. And that's just my personal take of being here, working in the city, understanding it. You know, we have a hierarchy here, but there are actually two hierarchies here, and we have to make sure that everyone is informed, and I feel left out when people have to call me, and where situations, uh, uh, even with some of the, the murders and things going on, I've asked the police department, make sure you call me. I need to know because people are calling me. So I shouldn't have to wait to hear it on the news or wait to the morning paper. I should be notified. This is what happened in your district in this city. So I'm abreast of what's going on. So I would I would hope that in the future we can find another plan or protocol to make sure this council is alerted. Fire department does a great job. You see doing a great job what you're doing. But I just think there's just one small missing piece that this council, this legislative branch, is left out of the process. Thank you. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, I'm, I want to uh, agree and thank you for the, the updates you do give. Uh, same thing during Hurricane Ian. I, re, uh, you know, 
everything I saw was on social media. Um, obviously, we got those reports a couple of times a day, but otherwise, I was just forwarding, sharing what I saw, which was which helpful. But again, um, like uh, Councilman Carlson said, I, I also saw on social media that um, St. Pete was talking about uh, evacuation and doing, like they just seemed to have information way before we did. Even the county would put stuff out on, on social media that we hadn't seen yet. And again, if I'm just a normal citizen, sure, um, it's, it's nice, but we, we are literally a large part of this government um, and we didn't know about it. Uh, I just, I don't feel comfortable finding out about that, about things that we're, we're planning to do or we're considering doing. I, I do think that there, I agree that we need a, a protocol to keep us somehow informed uh, ahead of time because we did. A lot of phone calls, a lot of neighbors, everybody wants to know what to do, and I didn't know what to tell them. Um, and it was, uh, Chief uh, Bennett kept us in, um, informed, but we're not always going to have a Chief Bennett. Um, I can't, we can't promise that the next Chief of Staff is going to be as communicative. We, we need a protocol that is going to be followed every single time. Um, so, uh, but I, I, again, I, I appreciate everything you do and I've signed up and I love it, but I feel like for us we need a, another level. Councilman Moran. What can I say that hasn't been said? <laughs> Huh. Nothing. So I agree, but I, uh, there's nothing I can add. But thank you for what you're doing. It's very important, you, and uh, we yeah, appreciate just, it very much. Yeah, just, I don't be Vieira. Yeah, and just very briefly, um, and, and we thank you for all your work, especially during uh, you know, the hurricane. I remember the, the funny video that went a little bit viral of Mayor Castro getting a call from President Biden, and you were kind of in the background there, so just kind of funny if you remember that, I assume. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you remember that, Chief? Or, uh... No. Okay. Chief, then, no. I, 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 that's why we know. Not else. you. Yeah. Going on. I remember you just the disregard. Okay. The, I thought it was hilarious, but I would say that, that again, we appreciate the efforts of, of John Bennett that something just a little bit more formal uh, for the information to come, uh, I, I think is certainly warranted and whatnot. You know, one thing, it's funny, I, I emailed my aide right now uh, to get together with our friends at the, at the Humane Society. Nothing that y'all got to deal with, I think, but I, I see over here for the uh, registration and vaccination for pet-friendly shelters that a lot of people, as y'all know, will not leave their homes without their pets. Those are their family, and a lot of people don't know about these requirements. So, you know, getting that information out, that's a big deal. I, I, it, close to a lot of people start to go, Councilwoman Hurtak, what's the name of that the nice new dog you're fostering? Oh, her name is Jelly. That is so yeah, sweet. Yeah, that, is so, yeah, that is so sweet. Um, but yeah, so just uh, a, a big issue that requires a lot of awareness. But just thank you guys for all your hard work uh, during last year. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, just to, just to add, besides um, natural disasters, um, uh, there are also emergency responses uh, with with fires, rescue vehicles, and police. And I'm on all the emails now where I'm getting alerts on all that, so that's very helpful. Um, somehow, I think Councilmember Goods, unfortunately, there's a lot of um, murder and other cases going on in his area, but um, he's somehow he's finding out about those and he's able to respond. Maybe it's because of his police background or something. But if, if, um, if something, some terrible criminal or fire thing happen in my district, I would want to know about it right away. And sometimes, like Councilmember Vieira said, sometimes Chief Bennett, if he's available, will alert us, uh, but it would be nice to have some formal process. And the last example I'll give was during the BLM protest two years ago, um, two or three times we had like a thousand people walking through Hyde Park and other neighborhoods. And I was desperately trying to find out uh, when those Pro, when those protests were happening and what the protocol was and how do we communicate with the neighborhoods? Do we tell um, the, who's communicating with neighborhoods? Is it us or somebody else? Do we tell them to, uh, neighbors to walk out and offer them uh, drinks and, and snacks or do we tell them to stay in their homes? Uh, should people drive or not drive? It would be nice to, um, I found out later that you know police have pretty good intel on what's happening. All of my intel was because I happened to be on some of the blogs where people I knew were talking about them. And, and I, I didn't have any updated information I could give the, the neighborhoods. And they were very, very frustrated because people didn't know what was happening. And I know that's an unprecedented thing, 
but who knows how soon something like that will happen again. We just need a, a protocol uh, to communicate in extraordinary times, and the city council has to have uh, a special kind of communication by district or, or for all of us, and then we have to have even better tools that we can use to communicate with our constituents. Thank you. Anyone else? Chief, do, we, do, we, do we need a motion to make sure we put this in place or can we get sure we can bring this back to we can get well, some kind of program? We got a couple of things we want to kind of clarify in a little bit because when you talk about a lot of natural disasters, we're talking about the stuff that we have. A lot of the information that you all are talking about, we don't have access to that as well. So we don't know some things. And a lot of things we cannot activate into the county because, once again, in certain jurisdictions that we can't, you know, evacuate something if the county or the state doesn't do their part. So when we get that information, we pull, we, we put it out as soon as we can. You know, now as far as coverage, whenever there's like the storm that came in, uh, with Ian, you know, not saying that you, you, you know, part of the city, but we had shelters for family members and stuff like that. Now, if we're looking for something different, then of course we'll have to look into that to have you all go to a certain place, you know, but we put that information out to, you know, where um, the city shelters are kind of uh, different than um, just a regular shelters. And we, we have multiple uh, pet friendly shelters as well. So a lot of this information, we do put it out. And if we don't put it out, we don't know about it, and I'm being honest with you. And then when we talk about a lot of incidents that happen in the neighborhoods when it comes to, that's kind of like not in our area um, as far as when it comes to, when I, when I use the word violent crimes and stuff, you know, we're more or less with, with the emergency uh, preparedness, you know, preparing for natural disasters, you know, man-man disasters that, you know, that we can handle. And I'll let John elaborate more on how the county intervened when it comes to the state, the county, and then down to the that, local. That's not what we're talking about, Chief. We're, we're talking about as city officials. We, we understand that the county may have things go on. You may just be getting information. We're asking that when you get the information, we should be notified versus, we put it out. versus the, before. before the public gets it, we should know. That's what we're talking about. Okay. We want that information before you put it out to the public or we got to hear from St. Pete's doing something. So that's what we're saying. That's where the disconnect is. When you hear it, you notify the mayor. We're saying this council should be notified before it goes out to the media what's going on so we have an idea for when it does happen or it's going to happen. We get those calls, we're able to tell our constituents, and that's the problem. We have our disconnect sometimes with our constituents when emergency situations go on. When I got a major fire that happened over here uh, two years ago, I knew about it in the morning, and people called me, I got a major fire over here I know nothing about. Those things like that, a district person needs to know that, that just happened in my district. And I've been telling the chief that the same thing. We're dealing, dealing with, I get, get, get two, three shot over in Johnson County Court. I, I don't get a call from anybody to the next day, but Calvin Johnson's been doing a great job, you know. Or I get neighbors knocking on the funeral, knocking on my door, say, hey, we got a big old fight over here, a big old fire over here. That's what we're talking about. We should have an alert. You, you, you're giving us that media alert as, as fun as a, a way to pacify us. I believe that you said that to us, but that really does us any good. We need to know, hear a voice that tell us, we had a major incident in your district. We wanted you to know what's going on. It is safe. No one's asking us to go into what the investigation is. And I'm not just talking about the fire, but I'm just saying in general, with police and fire. No one cares about the investigation. We just want to know, is it safe? What happened? So we can be able to tell the truth. Our police department or our fire department is handling the situation. Everything's fine. There was an incident, but they're handling it. We need to know that, and that's what's happening. We don't know, and then we get questioned, how come you as a council member don't know what's happening in your district? That's the problem we have an issue with. Councilman Carlos. Just, want, just real fast. My question about what, where am I supposed to go if my district is evacuated is not me requesting room in a shelter. I can find a place to go. The question is, what's the role of city council during that time? Okay. What, it, what it felt like is the mayor has special powers, so you guys are irrelevant. And, you know, worst case, something happens to a mayor, uh, how, does city, how does city council continue the government? I mean, we've got to, we, I, I think city council has to, uh, for the continuity of government, city council has to be engaged. But also we need to be engaged because we have to communicate with constituents. And, and constituents don't see the difference between mayor and city council. They think we all should know everything. And so they're upset with all of us if we, don't have, if we all don't have all the information. Thank I thank you for their support. I just got a couple questions. Uh, is the EOC going to be moving out to 
and a street. We did hear that just before. Um, I know it has gone back and forth, so uh, I, that originally was the plan to go there, but I did hear it was pulled out of that project, but then I just heard earlier that it's back in, so I'm curious about that. All right. Uh, I'm also understanding that if some emergency happens uh, and City Council has to shut down here, it is also going to Hannah Street so we can have live broadcasts and city government can, can carry on. Councilman Carlson's concerns are valid. We as city council need to know what's going on, and w w without a doubt. Uh, there's only one catch to that, that it should be one voice, whether it comes from us or, or whomever, because if one council person blasts out something on social media and another person blasts out something on social media and one number is off, one letter is off, it could be misconstrued 10 different ways. So I think, I think what city council is asking, hopefully what city council is asking, is for you to give us the information as soon as you possibly can. And I'm gonna to go to Chief Bennett because he's, he's right now in front of us. Chief. Good afternoon, Council John Bennett, Chief of Staff. Um, I appreciate the dialogue and the opportunity to uh, increase our performance in this space. As everybody was talking, I went through the recently promulgated 2022 Comprehensive Emergency Operations Plan uh, on the INA, and there is a special section, 4.2 Key Leadership Responsibilities, and there is a section in there for City Council, as well as the ESF Emergency Support Functions for Communications. And uh, I know I heard a, a discussion about a potential motion, but my question uh, to Chief Tripp and John A would be, would it be fair for council to review those two sections and then prior to the upcoming season uh, or within a recent amount of time, uh, work with council and the things that we have learned over the last couple of years and see if we can increase that, those sections of the emergency operations plan. Is that fair? Council? Chief Bennett, I think that um, you all have heard a lot of feedback from us today. Uh, maybe if, if uh, Councilmember Goods or someone is put, put, making a motion, maybe we could just have you all come back a month from now and we will have read that again and you all might have some updates. And Chief Bennett, you may want to present or bring the police or something because this hits more than just um, Chief Tripp's area. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. And the yeah. other thing I wanted to point out is um, you know, and coming from a 25 member government with probably the largest emergency management responsibility over the bridge, and then coming here to, uh, you know, essentially uh, a smaller set of jurisdictions, but uh, obviously more people. Um, typically the mayors of the, of the cities inside the county are what's called the executive policy group, and they are involved in the decision-making. During the COVID period, and, and legal can correct me if I'm wrong, they removed the mayor out of that process. So it, we are actually a little bit downstream of the working side of that equation, which is something that um, in a big city is, is something we have to, you know, work to bridge that communication to get it a little bit quicker. But yes, I understand. And, and really I was directing it to John uh, to see if these are two sections we can work on uh, in the CEOP. Chief, we're actually up for our three-year big update of this document. Every year we touch it and update our maps, but this is our three-year cycle, so definitely we would look to do a big rehash and update those sections um, and get that out to you that if we need to incorporate new language in those procedures of City Council's roles and responsibilities, this is a perfect period before the season starts. Councilwoman Hurt. Okay, we can, to Council, we can look at all hazards, day-to-day -day things that have been talked about, and of course the the, uh, the low probability, high consequence events that have been discussed and make sure they're all threaded in there for near real time updates. Councilwoman Hurt. Um, I appreciate, uh, thank you Chief Bennett for coming in and, and saying that. I would, I would love to take a look and read those, but I would really love for when you come back to come with some recommendations that we can work from. Um, as you are the emergency professionals, you're hearing what we're looking for, but I wouldn't know where to begin asking for that in the proper way or writing it into the plan in a proper way. So possibly maybe some suggestions. I would also ask of that from Chief of Staff uh, for when you come back, 
we can bring our thoughts, but, but you all are the ones that write this document. So you, probably you have uh, the opportunity to look at other documents that are similar. What kinds of things can, can we do to just solidify our role? So thank you. Mr. Shelby. Okay. Yes, if you can, just for the benefit of the city council, if you want, if they want to look at that section that was referenced and or the plan itself, how does one get to it on the INET? What is the best, so if you, quickest if, way? If you go to the INET, go under emergency management is one of the tabs. Under there, there will be plans. The, the plan is located right there. It's called the Comprehensive Emergency Operations Plan. Thank you. Emergency management. If they put, if they put that in the search term or if they find yeah, If you look for departments, emergency management is a standalone that you can click. Thank you very much. Councilwoman Hertek. Um, I will write that down, but is there any way that we, that could be sent to I'll us? Because that's a that's a that's always a, a much better reminder. Thank you. Chief Bennett, thank, City yeah, Council. yeah. Thank you, Chief Bennett. Any other further discussion from Council? Is there anyone in the audience, excuse me, in Council Chambers who wish to speak to this? Come up to the podium, please, Ms. Pointer. I'll talk about this in a minute. Um, first of all, uh, Stephanie Pointer. Um, first of all, as somebody who lives on that peninsula that Councilman Carlson was talking about, my house, the corner of my lot, is 13.42 feet. I am one of the highest locations in South Tampa because my neighborhood was built up as part of the development. So um, I've had. Councilman Carlson's been in my neighborhood. Councilman, our Councilwoman Hertak has been um, on a tour of SOG with me. I would invite all of you to come do a tour. Um, it's very concerning because if Ian had hit here, we, I didn't board anything up because if it hit here, boarding up is going to do nothing for us because I'm going to be inundated with water. Water is going to be my problem, not the wind. So bottom line is that the more people who can push something out from the city, why wouldn't, I mean, this is kind of a no-brainer. If a text goes to the mayor, it should go to each one of you as well. And here's the primary reason why. Because six of the seven of you I have talked to on the phone. Six of the seven of you I text on the phone for one reason or another, at one point in time or another. And I know that if I send you a text, you're going to respond to me. I have the mayor's number too, but I don't think I've ever sent her a text because I don't get responses from her emails. So I, I just need to keep that in mind. And I also want to point out, and this is something that drives me bonkers. I have been to the EOC as part of Mayor's Neighborhood University. How many of you guys have been through Mayor's Neighborhood University? Okay, and, and did you see anybody from city council there? No, you didn't. Okay, everybody needs to understand what your jobs are and how you support our government. And when we went through Mayor's Neighborhood University, I asked every single session, when are we gonna get to see city council? Because there were folks in there who've never interacted with you guys. And so I think this is kind of par for the course. And this, ad, this, this newsletter came out and somebody asked me this morning, why don't we have multiple people running for multiple races? And this is a problem. This is a newsletter from the city of Tampa. This is a newsletter from the city of Tampa. Does it say the city of Tampa at the top? No, it doesn't. I have a problem with the propaganda that goes out. Every single city of Tampa post that is posted on Facebook mentions the mayor by name and tags her. I have seen every single one of you in those posts and you've never been tagged. Why not? Everybody sitting up there works their butt off for this city. Why is it the Jane Castor show? Sorry, not sorry. And then her girlfriend, wife, whatever, significant other is spotlighted in these in addition to her. But I don't see any of your names up there and you guys are working your butt off, and you guys are standing in the same place right next to her. Shame, shame, shame. Miss Pointer. Yes, sir. I think I have a picture of you receiving your uh, certificate from Mayor's University. Probably. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilman Goose. I've always said that, and, and, and I'm glad you said it, Miss Pointer, is that the, 
most of the employees, I would say 90% of the employees here, don't even know who, who city council is. Have no clue. You can walk right by them and know who you are. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Amen. And that is true. Yeah. I, I can remember I went to, uh, the, the, when we had the so-called possible riots at the university mall. And I got out my car to stop the violence. And as I walked to approach some of the officers, had no clue who I even was. They were, it was kind of like here, which I know, it was, I, I, as a man of police, I understand what they were doing. Until someone said, no, that's your city council. You go to some of these departments right here, they have no clue who city council is or what our function. Yep. Couldn't tell you who we are. And it, it, that is a shame. I always say that every employee, every department should know this form of government. Not just the mayor, but who, 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 who writes the checks? Because at the end of the day, a lot of stuff happens. We, we still sign off on a lot of stuff that goes on out here. But no one knows about the council and at the, if, it's at, if it's the mayor's university, I've always said that too. If it's the mayor's university, and they're highlighting every department in the city, they, but they're not they're excluding the council. Yep. They should know what the council's function is, what we do. Yep. So I, I, I bring you from pointing that out. Uh, it's, it's a valid point. Just like the mayor's picture is here, you know, council members' pictures should be in, in these buildings as well, saying so you have the mayor here, this is your council. This is your city government. This is your government. Yep. So. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, there's no strife at anybody else, but it's a true statement that goes on that no one knows your, your city government. Thank you, Chairman. Councilman Carlson. I'll keep this short and we can talk about it offline, but just for anybody watching, and, and this is my perspective having, having watched and experienced it, um, under Pam Maiorio, the um, and some of her predecessors, the neighborhoods were very strong. Under the person who replaced her, um, he was afraid that of the power of the neighborhoods and push back against them. And so a bunch of us uh, started organizing, um, in, in particular, um, it, you know, grassroots organizing with, with neighborhoods. And as the neighborhoods were starting to get organized again, what we observed at the time was that Mayor's Neighborhood University was set up to kind of neutralize the, the, the grassroots movement of the neighborhoods and to kind of push propaganda. And so it's interesting that a lot of um, neighborhood leaders think it's special to go through neighborhood university. What it actually was is a way to take power away from neighborhoods. And I don't know what it's still like, but I hope that it's been revamped or I hope it can be revamped and maybe Than can help with it because it shouldn't be a propaganda machine and it shouldn't um, uh, try to take any power away from what's happening with the neighborhoods and the associated neighbors. The other thing on the newsletters, this mayor does the same thing that the last mayor did uh, with newsletters, and as far as I can see, um, in that if you look closely at the bottom of the emails, some of the emails are official city emails, and some of them look like city official emails, but they're not. They're coming from a campaign account or a PC or something like that. Um, and um, I don't know who operates those. I wish there was transparency as to whether staff are being used, who's paying for the uh, the, um, the email accounts and everything, but it's very confusing to the public because they think that it's, um, uh, that it's city and I think, I think all of it isn't. I mean, I understand why, from their perspective, why it's done, and it's great content and, and well done, but um, there, there needs to be some more clarity and separation between what potentially is, is campaign or personal stuff versus, um, versus city, thank you. Any other comments or questions on agenda number four? Councilman Hurtel. Do we need to make a motion for them to come back to yes, us? May I speak for just a minute? I apologize. I just want to acknowledge, I, I, since everyone's rehashing what happened in September, I just want to make sure Council knows um, after COVID, I became sort of the unacknowledged emergency. Um, deputy city attorney and then eventually city attorney and I always always made a point of notifying council of everything that was happening as it was happening I, I was just reminiscing about the night that the county declared a state of emergency for Ian and then the mayor subsequently did and I was on my way to a concert at Emily Arena and stopped here and came upstairs to send all of you and others at the city an email so that you were hearing it the second it happened. And during Ian, 
John Bennett asked me to help him, and we were constantly text messaging council members. So, and, and having been at the EOC and seeing how things played out, and also having a brother in Naples that ultimately was impacted by the hurricane, things were changing, things were happening, they were turning on a dime. And the second we were hearing things, we were pushing the information out, but sometimes, you know, we, we had to send it to everyone at the same time. We couldn't prioritize and send it to this one first and that one first. And, and as I think has been said over and over again, it's the county that makes the decision to start an evacuation. We would always, John always let me know the second he heard anything. I would always push out an email to all of you and to other department and to the department heads at the city and to the mayor. So we really have tried, I mean, during COVID, same thing. Every time the governor issued an order, I was frantically trying to get that information out to you as soon as we heard it. So I, I, I just, I'm not whining, perhaps I am, <laughs> but, but I feel as if some of that hasn't been acknowledged or recognized in some of your comments. So I just, I apologize. I just felt the need to say that. Thank you. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, and I appreciate that because we, we did get that information. Uh, I felt we had a lot more information, or rather we were getting regular updates ahead of time. But once Ian hit, our, our information drastically slowed. And that's when everyone starts to ask, when, uh, you know, what's the problem with electric? When can we come back? All of these questions and, and the flooding and all of this, then we didn't get much information after that at all. So that's why I think these, uh, you know, really going through this again, just to kind of um, improve it with t so that the next time it happens, because there will be a next time, we are prepared better we are better prepared as council members and as front lines to neighbors and residents and, th and that's that's just what we do so do we need a motion to bring this back at a particular time and day would you like to make a motion sure um i didn't what when are you all when is this this supposed to be i i believe um uh chief bennett said a month was that okay um, I'll make a motion to, uh, to bring this back March 2nd um, with some recommendations for council uh, in addition to talking about some of the other changes that might be coming. Second. A motion made by Councilwoman Hurtak, seconded by Councilman Carlson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you both. Thank you. Agenda item number five. I don't think I introduced myself a moment ago <laughs> during my wine session. Um, Andrea Zelman, city attorney. Um, this, I resubmitted to council the memo that I wrote in July of 2022. Um, the motion requested that staff report on a proposed ordinance that would require the administration to provide council with 10 day notice on matters pertaining to civil rights and criminal investigations against the city of Tampa. And, and as I explained in the motion, I mean in the memo, you know, there's investigations and there's investigations. The, I, what, tri what obviously triggered this motion was a particular incident where the city was notified that the Department of Justice was um, investigating that particular um, tenant, um, the, the tenants issue. I, can't remember now the name of the program, the Crime Free Program, I apologize. Um, and I believe the city heard about it just before Christmas in 2021 and made council aware of the investigation, I believe early in April. Um, but I would caution council to, you know, allow a single incident like that to trigger some ordinance that, you know, might not fit so many of the other instances, you know, those, those kinds of investigations are kind of a once in a decade occurrence. There are of all sorts of investigations that take place. 
we have people at the city filing employment discrimination complaints. Those have to be kept confidential. We have law enforcement members who are employees who sometimes aren't even notified that they're under investigation by outside agencies. Um, there's, there's, as I said, there's investigations that, and there's investigations and it's hard to find a one size fits all solution to the way in which the communication is provided. Again, some have to be kept confidential, others don't. You know, I think what we can take away from the particular incident that triggered this is that, you know, yes, the, the mayor has acknowledged, I believe very recently, that she wishes sometimes communication happened more openly and quickly, and this is an example, but I don't believe that an ordinance is the, re the correct response to it, as I've outlined in this memo and, and as I'm trying to explain now. Um, I think we just need to come to an understanding of what type of investigations are confidential, what aren't, and when it's appropriate to go public. You know, when you're being investigated, what the city's lawyers and, and the city is using outside lawyers in that particular matter, what they tell you is don't talk about it. You don't talk about an ongoing investigation of your own actions. So, you know, there's a certain amount of, of keeping everything as quiet as possible. So it's, you know, again, it's, it's a delicate thing. You know, perhaps it could be a one-on-one -on -one conversation with each council member of this type of investigation. I think that's, you know, we can talk about the best way to handle it, but I don't think it's possible to craft an ordinance that could apply to every situation because each one is going to have nuances um, that would be difficult to address in an ordinance. So I'm happy to answer questions. Questions? Would you like to go, Councilman Bureau? Please go right ahead. He hasn't raised his hand yet, so you're up to bat. But before you start, I apologize. I have to be on a conference call at 3:30, which will last for a half an hour. I do too. I really wanted to hear nine and ten. One of them was my motion to bring this before. Letting you know, I have to be on this conference call. I hope to be back. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you very much. And and. Really quick, and, and you know, I was asked about this yesterday, and I said I, I support it in, in principle, and I hope that we can build a bridge to get to something like this. But let me ask you, because that, that's kind of what I thought of, which is, you know, what is a civil rights investigation? It could be anything from uh, an allegation of, of uh, excessive force by a law enforcement officer to something that's more systemic. And maybe there could be a way where we could take care of the confidentiality issues and maybe look at something that could be relegated to either what is alleged to be a systemic practice or a program like crime-free housing so that we address some of those concerns that you've legitimately laid out. So just, just my thoughts. Again, I don't want to dive, I don't like speaking before makers of motion. That's, that's just me when it's not mine, but just my initial impression. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, so, um, Councilmember Goods has a saying that is one that I've liked to use in the past, but he says it better, which is, don't tell me what we can't do, tell me what we can do. And I feel like too often we are told what we can't do. And um, I'm having, having been told before that it wasn't, that it was hard to do, I wish we had some more of a solution here. Um, it, you know, if you read the media and listen to the community, the community is, the, the impression in the community is that the administration rapidly releases or leaks or promotes information that is disparaging about council members, but then doesn't release information that doesn't look good for them or their allies. And um, the, um, in this particular case, I think this is the, probably the most important thing that's happened in, in this city since we've been on council. And I'm, the mayor had a press conference about transparency and accountability, talking about council. But at the same time, this had not been released. And the way we found out about it was that, is that a reporter found out, pulled up public records, 
and after two weeks had not gotten a response on the public records, and then the mayor had a press conference at 4.30 on Friday to talk about uh, protecting victims' rights, and in the middle of the press conference said, oh, and by the way, we sent a letter to HUD, and you know, HUD and Department of Justice are kind of related, so they, instead of responding from HUD, they responded from Department of Justice. And all of that was terrible because it eroded, quickly eroded trust in the community. Um, there are a couple of media outlets there that figured out what happened and the significance of it. And I, I would just say from a, from a communication point of view, I would just ask the administration, when there's something this significant, especially if it's embarrassing to the administration, tell us quickly. It's much worse, you know, it's just like when you're a kid and you screw up, your parents say, well, if you had told me and been honest about it, I wouldn't punish you as badly. We can't punish the mayor, but um, uh, it's not good for the public to not know about something like this. This is very significant. And in 13 months or whatever, we haven't been updated on it. I asked Chief Bennett last week. We, don't, said, get, we don't get updated either. The Department of Justice will not provide the city with information about an ongoing investigation. So um, anyway, I, I think that if, and, 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 the, and the way it was done, and anybody in PR knows if you release something on a Friday, the title, the topic was not about the Justice Department investigation, it was about victims' rights. It was buried in there on a Friday afternoon when, when the, you, you release things on a Friday afternoon because the media won't pay attention, not many reporters will show up. And then they said that, that it was a response to our HUD letter, which nobody believes. So uh, the best thing to do is if something bad happens, hold a press conference and be direct and honest about it. Call us first and then have the press conference right after. But, but um, be open and honest about it and say this is what happened and we're looking at it. By the way, we had already changed the program so it's not, it's not that big a deal. The mayor could own it and say, look, um, uh, I worked with my police chief to change the program, and so now we're looking at the new program as we go forward. But if we made any mistakes in the past, we want to own up to them and work with them to make sure that. But, but we've already changed it. All of that would have been great. Uh, but going forward, um, we could have an, the, the city, not we, but the, the city could have an administration that's worse, that doesn't uh, bring counsel on anything. And uh, I hear a lot of complaints in the community about um, how um, public records take forever, how um, my own public records requests haven't been responded to in a month or two, <laughs> um, uh, how people ask specific questions and, and somebody responds to them and says, well, you're not specific enough. You know, if you say, I want a certain contract on a certain day with this company from this topic, and they say, oh, well, you, didn't, you need to tell us which one. Well, how would somebody even know the answer to that? And so I think we, we desperately need to work on transparency. And I would just ask you, I don't know if anybody else wants to make a motion, but I would just ask you to maybe make a motion to have you come back on May, March 2nd and just tell us what we can do. Is there, we could have a resolution request, but mm -hmm. if, we got, if we got a mayor that was worse and, and refused to tell a future city council anything, that's a really bad situation because the city council's uh, uh, liable. And, I, and I'll contrast that to your work with us on these uh, four years of uh, settlement agreements that were not approved by city council. You came forward and worked quickly with us and we resol resolved the problem. And so uh, somehow we need to institutionalize and we need a solution for how to prevent that in the future. Thank you. Anybody else? Council member Goose. You have an apple and you have an orange. In my mind, the federal investigation is an orange. A police investigation of a citizen's complaint is a different type of investigation. That's an apple. I don't even know about that. That's the investigation going on. But a major investigation of a city, the council should know about. Again, we're talking about an apple and an orange. A EEOC complaint by an employee, I guess an administrator, whatever, whatever. I, we don't even, I, don't, I don't really care about that. That, that, that goes to what's the process. But a Department of Justice investigation against the city of Tampa Police Department or against the city of Tampa's administration, yeah, that's something that the, the council needs to know about. So it's not about what you can't do, but I see something we can do here. I think we're talking about two different types, the apple and the orange. I think we look at the orange. The other things are, I would say, employee-type issue investigations versus a magnitude of a city investigation from an outside agencies or, you know, uh, I think that's a different type of investigation. 
So I can concur with some of what Ms. Zellman is saying in reference to the apple, but I think it's something we can do with the orange. I yield back to you. Councilwoman Herta. Um, I'll agree. Um, I think that the fact that the city has now been the subject of a Department of Justice investigation twice in six years? No, the other one Seven? was, I believe, 2015. 15. 15, so yeah, eight years, well, seven years, because it happened last year, is, is not good. There, there's nothing good about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, we, we should have found out about it ahead of time. When stuff like this comes in front of us, and you say it's, it's a rarity, but unfortunately, we're finding out that it's not. Um, every seven years, it's not acceptable, or twice in seven years. Um, so I would want something, not just coming back saying what you can do, but saying what, what we will be writing, what the ordinance will say to make sure that council is uh, notified within these 10 days for a um, civil rights investigation pertaining to this the city of Tampa not its employees but the city of Tampa because I believe that's what the Department of Justice investigation was about correct the city correct. not employees correct so I think we could differentiate that um, I, I don't think I think that's what we're all trying to say here so I would like to go even stronger than a recommendation and, and have you come back with um, with an actual ordinance that would do that, and then we can can talk about the specifics then. Wait, the council. No, I, I just Moran. there's a motion on the floor. I just that's wait on the motion. Wait, I thought you had a motion first. You want to go with the? No, I, I was just seconding hers. Oh, oh I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't making a motion, but I will. Uh, um, but if no, you would I, like to I speak first, I had made a motion. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> That's what I heard anyway. What I like to know is when, when these things happen for an investigation from any federal agencies that have some jurisdictional power within the courts and so forth, I guess that's what this is, uh, against a city, not in the individuals, against an entity of the city. How is it framed? I don't know. Does it, does it specifically say what it's all about and who is involved and so forth and so on? I don't know. Well, what I can tell you in this case, again, the, the Department of Justice basically sent the city a letter notifying the city that they were going to investigate. They specifically referenced the series of articles that had been written by the Tampa Bay Times, and they said they were going to investigate the incidents um, re, you know, reflected in that. And then they also asked the city, that letter included a very long list of records that they asked the city to produce, which the city did promptly. I guess it's been done. After that, yeah, what well, the city did re did provide all those records. After that, again, I want to reiterate, because I said it quickly, we are not kept informed. The city does right. not receive further communication from the Department of Justice about the status of that investigation. So I, I just want to make that clear, that we're as much in the dark as you are at this point. So then we don't know enough and you don't know anything enough to tell us about. Correct. Correct. While the investigation is ongoing, the city is not given <clears throat> any kind of status reports. So then in the time frame, it's been how long since this started? This, the letter came to us December of 2022. It takes a minute for the department. 21. So it, it I takes some time, it takes I guess. Yeah, it takes them a minute. They got more than the city of Tampa then. No, this is a this is an investigation of Tampa's yeah. program. I understand. Yeah. We should at least be notified because that's that's about it. So uh, it's up to the Department of Justice. It may take two or three years or four could, could years. Who knows? Yeah. Councilman Carlson. Sorry, I just had to ask. Um, are there any other investigations that you're aware of uh, from the Department of Justice or or um, FDLE right now? Um, you know, there, there, um, there's been a lot of discussions about single big contracts and insider deals and things like that with the last two administrations. Um, a lot, of, a lot of people have come to me and said they've reported to various agencies. Um, is there any other inv ongoing investigation right now? Is any has have we, has the city received any other letter? No. And and if we, how would we know if if the city got a letter like that that we would see it next time? Let's say it's about. Um, purchasing or something um, how would it, it so that wouldn't 
I, I would, I, I guess the, maybe the motion I would make is if the city is under investigation by the, um, you, in, in any form by the U.S. Department of Justice or FDLE that we would be notified, not individuals, but if the city was being investigated, it would be notified. Second. We have a motion. Was that, was it, we, just, we just flew back and forth with motions before. That wasn't a motion you made that was seconded by him. She didn't is make this, an official motion. Right, so the question then is, could you restate that in the form of a motion then, what you want to have as Get a it. result? Because I, I'm, I'm curious as to how this would be put in the form of an ordinance. I'm listening to this discussion, and it, I, I understand the situation, but how do you, how is it, I mean, even if it was an ordinance, the question is, what is the remedy with the ordinance as opposed to creating a policy or an agreement between the, an administration with this council? Um, you, could, you could put it in the form of an ordinance, but ultimately, what's the remedy that's going to be sure to make what you want to have accomplished, accomplished. Because it's, it's, this would be a rather, this would be, this is a very specific issue mm -hmm. that I would agree with the city attorney whether an ordinance would actually be something that would really address this issue in the way that you want. I'm not questioning what you want to have accomplished. I'm just saying is what is the most effective, consistent assurance that you will get what you want having something on the books, or is there another way that it can be accomplished through with this administration because... But if we do a resolution, then they, they can just ignore it. So yeah. what, yeah. I mean, there's That's the charter issue of whether we have, um, Andrea Putner, remember the charter issue about whether we can instruct the, I mean, is it, is it possible to, instead of saying the mayor must inform us, that staff must inform us, or the city attorney, the city attorney, it technically reports to us. Um, shouldn't we, can we write an ordinance to require the city attorney to inform us about their, um, uh, their being informed of, of a federal or FDLE investigation? Well, that, that and, and Marty touched on what I was gonna say is, is it possible to amend your motion to not necessarily um, require an ordinance, but let us figure out if there's some other way to have some sort of enforceable protocol between the administration and the city council. Because That's what I thought this was gonna be. That's what, um, um, But again, I don't think an ordinance is the appropriate vehicle. Uh, I don't agree because this is something that has happened that if it hadn't been discovered, we would still be in the dark about. Um, and I don't think you can just ask your way out of this. Mm -hmm or just say nicely, please make sure you do this in the future, an ordinance would make it be a requirement. I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to look at multiple things, but an ordinance better be on the list because I don't know other ways to really make sure. I mean, a policy is great, but there's not really any teeth behind that. Council Member may, may, may Pierre, I, and then Mr. If, okay, I All just- right, flip it around. Mr. If, no, it's up That's to you, Council. Go ahead. If this were, if you were a, a, a board in a city manager form of government and you had a city manager, then that would be one thing. I can, I know there are other strong mayor forms of government, not only in this state but throughout this country, that have to deal with things probably, fortunately for the city of Tampa, that deal with other cities a lot more, the, the Department of Justice dealing with the cities a lot more than Tampa. There has got to be, it raises, you raise a very good question. How in those strong mayor forms of government does <coughs> the strong mayor then communicate with their body, whether it be the, the, the city council of, 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 uh, of the city or whatever the legislative body is? Can yes. we start calling it elected mayor instead of strong mayor because it's a misnomer? Well, that's, okay, I understand that. Great, Council Member Vieira, then Council Member Goose. Well, it's all the reason if, 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 yeah, if you go want ahead, to go first. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, you raise the point. So yes, well, that's, that's nowhere in our, our, our charter. It's just exactly. we have an elected mayor. Uh, but I do believe if the uh, orders dictates to where the, the mayor and the city attorney must notify this council, now you have two people accountable. Because the city attorney also, with, with the word I've been using, represents the city. Yes. 
what, what, wait, wait, say, say that again. I'm sorry. Because all I've been hearing is the city attorney doesn't necessarily represent council; they represent the city. city. So if the city attorney represents the city per se, then the city attorney should be in that order because the mayor is going to give the city attorney uh, this from a Department of Justice investigation. So I believe that the verbiage needs to have the city attorney be responsible, with, along with or the mayor uh, or the administration to notify uh, this council of those type of investigations. So that way you have two people accountable uh, to make sure that the council is aware of uh, any type of investigation of that magnitude. Councilman Beard. And thank you. And, and just, and I think something that uh, Ms. Zellman said is very on point here, which is consistent. I think what everybody here is saying who has spoke on this, which is you said some enforceable, enforceable mechanism, whether it's an ordinance or something that we're just not thinking of here. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's what we're looking at, which is not, not the uh, 10 suggestions, but the 10 commandments. And whether the 10 commandments come through an ordinance or whether they come through something else, something that is enforceable and something that is workable and consistent with uh, applicable law. I think that's what we're all looking at. And if there's something we're not thinking of, you know, that's fine. Um, but but I, I think we all support having some sort of enforceable, enforceable tool, whatever it may be, to have notice to city council. And and so that's that's the way I kind of see the motion um, and, and just to move it forward and, and whatnot. Councilman Carl. How about I'll make a motion and you're good about talking to us in between meetings. If you and Morris and your team come up with a better idea, call us. And if it's a better idea, we'll, we'll replace it. And, and we, we don't have to go all the way to the end. Um, so I'll just make a motion to ask the city attorney to return on March 2nd to, uh, with a draft ordinance um, that would require the city attorney to inform city council within 10 days of the receipt of a letter or notice of investigation of the city, not individuals, by the uh, United States Department of Justice or FDLE, Florida Department Law Enforcement. Is it Florida Department yeah. Law Enforcement? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Our brain's we have a second. Second. We have a and if second I may, from Councilmember Hertek and discussion with Councilman Vieira. And just very briefly, so we can move this forward. So, Councilman Carlson, are you saying that in, in your uh, 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 preface to that, that if uh, there are discussions in between on some other, because again, I, I just want to get this done, no, I don't mean today in terms of getting out, I'm talking about get something done that is enforceable, whether it's an order or, or something we're not thinking of, is that kind of what you're thinking of? Yeah, my, okay. we've, we've had this on the agenda twice, and so um, if we can, it, I, I would like to approve at first reading something ideally on, on March 2nd, so if you come up with a better idea before then, um, then why don't you come, if you don't mind, come to us individually, and at the very next meeting, I or someone can make a motion to replace that one, and we could also change the dates. But, um, I mean, just to be honest, we don't know w what council is going to look like after May 1st. No, that's fair. Thank and so, We have thank a motion you. and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you. Uh, do, that's fine. Do we have public comment? Yes, ma'am? Excuse me. I, I have a city call. I'll be right back after. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Keela McCaskill. Uh, you know, I think it's a shame that you even have to do this. I just believe as a leader of this city, you should want to convey that information to you all. You should want to tell the public. You just want to tell everybody. In, in making the decision, I know they'll come back, and I'm so happy that all of you saw it reasonable to push for what you wanted and not let legal come back and tell you all that. I think oftentimes they don't factor in what we've been through in this city. We went through a lot. I mean, it was just absolute hell in the city of Tampa, so much so that the mayor said in April of last year, she called that press conference asking or encouraging to enhance transparency and accountability. I saw in an article this week, just this week, she admitted that communication could have been improved in her last term. I believe that that's her effort. As, as much as I probably criticize her, I'm hoping that that was her effort to try to get this lack of trust and lack of transparency and accountability right. That's one big step. It's huge for her to admit it. So it's another step for us to actually see what you're going to do, not only do we want an ordinance or a policy or whatever that's going to look like? But I want to know from the administration, what are you going to do to enhance transparency and accountability? That whole veto thing, that shot that in the foot. This is your next opportunity to try to get transparency and accountability 
and improving communication. I want to know how you're going to do that. We, we all want to live in a peace, you know, contrary to popular belief, I want to live peacefully amongst, you know, everybody. So I would like to see you improve in the area that you admitted there's problems, which is communication, and then also work on that transparency and accountability. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Stephanie Pointer. Um, you know, we talked about the two incidents here where the DOJ has been here. But what I think is interesting is I just learned a couple weeks ago that the mayor was like a monitor for Miami for their DOJ investigation. Like she got paid a lot of money when she was running for mayor to do that. So I would think that she would know as well as anybody what the citizens need to know because there was some hubbub as part of that her $150 an hour job that she was doing while she was running for mayor, um, that, that you would think that she would know what the citizens want to know as somebody who has monitored a city that had an issue. I don't know. It's just something to think about. Y'all have a great day. I'm going home. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Any other discussion? Thank you very much. We move on to item number nine. This is T&I staff, city clerk's office, and legal to report on the costs and feasibility and council chambers have staff reports to be held on a separate day other than Thursdays. Who would like to take this item because it's a, a group of individuals? Mr. Shelby? Actually, we have John Bennett on the uh, line as well. Mr. Bennett is online and I'll also point out that the the chair is the one who initiated this. All right, we'll come back and to it. He said he'll be uh, 30 minutes. At, this, at 4 o'clock? Yeah. yeah. The um, next item is initiated by Councilmember Vieira, who stepped out. Yes. This is, I mean. The two are related. They we are can't related. Take, we can't take up, actually, frankly, it, 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 depending on how you handle number 9 is how you handle number 10. So. Do you want to take a recess until 4? I know, no? Oh, we have the clerk. Yes, ma'am. But but you're doing this but, without the benefit of who the yes, proponent of and the maker of the motion. But here's the thing: we don't have to make any decisions today. Yeah, we're just we, having we a can discussion. hear things. They can go back and watch the tape. We can come back in another day. Second that motion. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, Shirley Fox, No City Clerk. Uh, this is regarding a. Um, an additional meeting for council and um, as far as the our position the city clerk's office position um, basically staffing is not available to cover an additional meeting there is a lot of work that goes on um, in the background to process meetings each week uh, council already added a commendation session uh, that brings the meetings for council to seven per month, to regular sessions, to evening sessions, one CRA session, one commendation session, and one workshop session. This does not include special call meetings or additional night meetings that may be requested. Our office also covers the board meetings such as code enforcement, um, special magistrate meetings, uh, citizen review board, uh, civil service, and the budget advisory um, um, session. Staff needs ample time for pre-meeting prep um, as well as post-meeting work for each meeting. Additional staff will need to be hired and trained to assist with any additional meeting. Um, our recommendation would be to have staff report sessions to replace workshop sessions. Uh, this will call for excellent planning and moving some item, items out further, similar to the court system. If a subject matter such as uh, land development amendments um, need to be workshop, then a special call workshop can be scheduled. 
Our office is like the hub of the city. We serve you, the administration, other departments, and of course, the public. Uh, we will shortly be working on a replacement for the agenda management system replacing SIRE. Lastly, the city clerk's office has a wonderful and dedicated staff doing our best for you, the administration, and our public. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Councilwoman Hurtag. Um, we do absolutely appreciate all the work you do, and it's known. We get emails at all times. Uh, it's, and we re I, I, and I, I think I can speak for others, really appreciate the, the wonderful work you all do. Um, first of all, and, and I'm putting you on the spot here, mm -hmm. Do you feel you're adequately staffed? Would you like more staff? Um, we have a deputy out um, oh, okay. right now. Um, I think we're okay. We're, we, we do our very best. We're trying to be uh, good stewards of the city's resources and everybody's doing their part. If we need um, additional staff, we'll ask. So to follow up on that, because I mean, you bring up a really interesting point of having, instead of a workshop session, to actually move, um, oh gosh, it, uh, the staff reports to a mm -hmm. different day, um, and then hold special call sessions for particular subjects. Um, if, if we were to, to start that model, I would be more comfortable doing so with adding another staff member, because I can see right now that we would have special calls. That would be something we would do. Um, so, so if if we if we were to adopt a sim similar model, um, and I would want to do so with a appropriate staff. Mm -hmm. If if say we would have a special call maybe every other month, would one additional staff member be enough to make sure the load is equal, or would you need a second staff member and just prepare for that? You don't call special uh, call meetings every other month. I mean, you will call it for special items. Mm -hmm. um, so right now, I would really just hold off okay. on doing anything. And really what I was saying was to replace um, um, staff meetings um, in, in place of the workshop meetings. Sometimes staff meetings end up being workshop meetings. It's true. So. Um, and if you do that, I would limit it so that you won't, you don't have to use the entire day for that. Maybe limit it to 10 um, staff meetings. And you know, like the court system, just because you want a certain things, certain item to happen the next month, it, it, it you know, it doesn't happen like that. Uh, and I have one more question, if you don't mind, that's a little off topic, but uh, we noticed it twice today um, that several of the uh, PowerPoints or the reports were not available in SIRE ahead of time. What is your general rule about when things need to be to you in SIRE? I believe it's the week before so, when, so when the agenda comes out. I don't know. Sometimes there are special circumstances. But generally, it's Friday, if I'm yes. not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And is, there is currently no, no um, real um, stick, as you were, carrot and stick. There's, no, there's no, nothing that really requires someone to have something in by a certain time, is there? Uh, we would want it, I mean, th there is a cutoff for when you would have to walk in uh, a certain item. but. Um, I would say as early as possible. Okay. And it has to be approved by the chair. Yeah, exactly. And I'm just saying that, that several of these things were not available in SIRE for us to preview or for the public. So that was just a question. Sorry, a little off topic. I have uh, Suling here. Okay, Suling. Hi, I was listening in the back. Oh, go ahead. The chairman. Councilman Goods, you are recognized. Miss Shirley, you, you're the most sweetest lady I know. Humblest can be. But you need more staff over there. You have an employee who's been out for almost two and a half, maybe three years. That's a slot that's down. It's a slot that's down. The city is growing. 
public records. People are coming in more frequently for the clerk's office. You have workers who, who do extra for this council. I'm appreciative of them all. I know how the system works. But you need more staff, Ms. Shirley. This, this, this city has grown, and you need some more help over there. Uh, I've watched it. I've watched the ladies work. I've watched their work. And again, you have an employee who's been out for a long time. That's a slot that someone can be doing some work. So uh, it's your department, and I have to respect that. But I have to look at what I see and also what I hear. And for me, uh, to get the job done that this council really needs, I truly believe you need more people. And I, I'm going to stand by that, but it's your department. You, you work it every day, but I know what I hear, I know what I see. And I'm going to say, say it that maybe others won't say it, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor that you get some more people over there to help you uh, in that department over there, and especially with a staff member out that long of a period of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. All right. Suleen Lucas, Deputy City Clerk. To answer your question, Council Member Hurtet, Council did make a motion a while back to have staff um, submit any PowerPoints and memorandums the Thursday before the draft is released, which the, that Friday the draft is released. I can say um, administration staff has been very good at submitting those documents. There are times that they have last minute documents that need to be submitted and that's why it does not get to us and into mm -hmm. SIRE. So I can say they have been very diligent in getting those documents to us. Thank you so much. I, and, and I know, um, because I know we talked about uh, uh, folks, and, and this is, it's come in front of council before, but I just thought it was very interesting that on a day we only had 10, well, yeah, 10 things that two of, two of them were missing from like preview and things like that. But not your fault, obviously, right. but just, you know, maybe, maybe a good time to remind staff that it is really helpful for us um, so it actually really uh, speeds up things. We, we, can, we have to ask fewer questions mm -hmm. if we're prepared in mm -hmm. advance um, because oftentimes then we can have our questions answered in advance. So thank you so much for You're that welcome. update. Thank you both. Thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, would this also be sufficient for number 10 or is that a separate discussion regarding staff reports? Anybody? You're down to four council members. You had a special discussion meeting on January 10th. Um, I provided you the minutes yesterday of, the, of that. Um, there was no official action taken. Uh, I will point out, council, that if we look at February's meeting, February 2nd has 13 staff reports on it. The workshop on the 23rd of February as 14 items, and I understand the two of them might be continued. Um, and again, when you have, on the 23rd of February, just as you have tonight, you have, in an hour, you have your evening meeting started. So- It's a busy place. It, it busy certainly place. is. There was some discussion, if you look at the minutes, that the way if council chooses to structure their meetings and council um, uh, enforces those decisions, you can do away with the commendations on a separate day. And the chair had raised this. They could be limited to three commendations at let's say 10 minutes each total or 15 minutes each total. You're right. Mm -hmm. And then what You're happens right. is then there's an advantage to that that being up, we have almost a full council, Mr. Chairman. I was just discussing the concept, I was just discussing the concept that was raised at the special discussion meeting about returning commendations to a regular meeting day, limiting the amount of commendations, limiting the amount of time, perhaps creating different categories of commendations, um, and having a certain criteria, perhaps, and have different facets, perhaps, a. Uh, um, uh, a different kind of uh, recognition 
for off-site or commendations, but for in-person commendations to be able to return them to a regular meeting day. And you had raised the issue, Mr. Chair. This was your motion, number nine, um, to talk about the concept of having a, a separate day for staff reports. The staff, the clerk made a, a, a report on that while you were out. And um, I, I believe, I don't know whether you want to recap that for the chair, but the point is ultimately, um, council, it's your meeting um, and it's your decision how you want to conduct it. So that being said, I'll, I'll, I'll just turn it Mr. back Chairman. to the chair. Mr. Chairman. Councilman Goodrich. Mr. Shelby, why, why, why did we move accommodations to a separate day? You remember? Yes, because commendations were becoming lengthy um, because also lengthy in number and also lengthy in time. There was also the concept of the way you have it now, you have the police department on a monthly basis, whereas you have the firefighters on a quarterly basis. And I understand ATU is, I don't know, is that bi-monthly or monthly? Bi-monthly. It's bi-monthly. So every, every one of them is on a different schedule, which affects how your meetings flow. And the addition of the community recognition for each recipient, the line. So, much so let, let's just let's just put before we even get to accommodation. Let's just put a ten-minute presentation in there from some organization, which will probably take twenty minutes. Mm -hmm. Let's put that in there first. Then let's go with the accommodations. We are almost to probably probably about, about maybe ten thirty. Right, to, by 1030, right? So, so that's why, you know, public we, have, we have to use, you know, you always use the word common sense, but again, the city has grown, time has changed. So if you bring accommodations back how it used to be, we're going to be in the same situation. Not necessarily. I, I disagree because the timeline, because you can't gauge how long the time will be when you have a presentation or maybe two presentations, and then accommodations, you know. Uh, and then public comment. But public comment, I forgot about that. If this this ver this variables I mean, the, the, that you, you don't know, have control And, and look what time it is right now, four o'clock. We start at 501 tonight, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. We got lucky that we don't really have some more longer items because we, we, we've been late, right, Mr. Brandon? Last, last time we were here. Late today, is all day for me. Right, right. But see, I don't have a problem. We, we, were, we were here to what? It was after 6 the last time we were here. So if we would have had a, a night meeting, yeah. we, we, we got to wake up, people. I mean, I know, you know, you know we, we are elected to work. And unfortunately, the workload has gotten a little bit uh, more now, unfortunately. I, I, I'm not going to disagree totally with you, but we used to have the items done individually. There was no 40 to 57. You had to vote on each one individually. And we never left here past 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Things are different. I understand that. And technology, in fact, the clerk's office had a run, and we had to help them with the AB Dick machine to print out the agenda. It was done right back here. On a, what do you call those things? Uh, Mimeograph. Yeah, uh, yeah, we had to do it right here. So I can understand the difference. Now it's faster and it's longer. <laughs> so we've made a lot of progress. But what I'm saying is, it's just that we take something that should take an hour, it takes three hours. And I understand that to a point. But not everything should take three hours. We, we take uh, the combination thing. I get a combination name. If I was to get a combination from this council, I don't know who in the hell signed it. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, so what what um, Ms. Fox Knoll's recommendation was, was to take away workshops and put staff reports there, since most staff reports turn into workshops anyway. Um, I don't think it's a terrible idea. Uh, I actually think it's a very good idea. Um, my recommendation for commendations is, and presentations, is we have a timer. We ought to use it. Yeah. Five minutes and then five minutes for us to, you know, uh, say great and ask some questions. And 
The other thing we do with commendations is we, we do let them go out long and then each of us has to say something that's new. We didn't do that before. Um, so maybe just a nice round of applause and we, we move you. on. Um, and, and if we only do three at a, at a time, we really are moving things along. Um, a lot of these commendations, while wonderful, can be done off-site um, for certain events. But I, and I also think we talked about limiting the number of commendations that a council member can give out in a year, which would then allow all of those people to make their way here. Uh, so I think, I think we could absolutely do it with time management and um, taking away extraneous conversation. Um, however, uh, Ms. Fox Knowles gave me an idea. We already have that commendation day. Right now, we, we did a lot of makeup for, um, for land use issues. We may have to do a few makeup council sessions to get this stuff down to a reasonable space. And I think that a comm that commendation day space might be good for trying to get some of this stuff out of the way. Does that make any sense? To try to consolidate a little bit? Um, and then maybe, like she said, hold those that for a special call meeting on some of these topics. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Council, um, Morris Massey from the legal department, and we were also asked to, to give input on this. And <clears throat> to your point, uh, Councilwoman Hurtak, and as Celine mentioned, we, we are endeavoring, the legal department works with you all and with the administration to try to make sure that things get uploaded into the agenda, into SIRE, so you all have the appropriate backup at least a week in advance. We really do. And we, I mean, every week I, we're, we have a legal department meeting where a good portion of the meeting is going through all your motions going through all the matters that are on the agenda, trying to make sure that we're tracking to make sure that we get the items done in a timely fashion so that it can get uploaded so you all have time to look at it in advance of the meeting. The one concern that we do have if we add another meeting where we're doing staff reports, workshop items, that's going to be another deadline in the process where it, and we're already having a difficult time sometimes keeping up with the deadlines for the workload that's here. So I just want to make the council aware of that. We'll work, we'll work as hard as we can and we'll work with you as much as we can, but that, that is just an issue that we just wanted to bring forward to you all, so. Councilman Vieira. Thank you, sir. Um, a couple of things, you know, um, I, and, and the, the next one down, I talked about, um, uh, or, or before, I don't know when, when it's here, um, about staff reports and kind of following the rules that we have, which are very, very difficult to follow. So I'm not, I'm not looking at the chair. Chairman Citra does a great job. When I was chair, I found it hard to you know, limit it within there. But if we reform the rules to accept reality and say staff reports are going to be five minutes, let's say 10 minutes uh, total with uh, one or two minutes of, of commenting, and if it goes further than that, then it should be a workshop. We can do that. Um, yes, the city is growing a big deal. Uh, significantly, but council meetings have grown far vast beyond what the city is growing. I always, I, I always like to use um, uh, 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 sayings with waist sizes, which is if, if a year ago you were size 36 and now you're size 42, the answer to that isn't to buy size 44 pants. It's to maybe go back to 36 or 38 or 40 or whatever it may be. Um, th that, that's the way that I see this. And the biggest, um, the, the saddest thing of it all is that a lot of the public that has business before council uh, for which they're paying advocates and attorneys at three, four hundred dollars an hour um, are sitting here waiting six, seven, eight, nine hours um, at a time. I don't think we need another council day. I, I, I think that will only, I, I think we'll fill up that day and then we'll come back and, 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 and still have the same problem. I think what we have to do is, is to implement reasonable rules uh, especially for um, staff reports. I think that's the, the major issue is staff reports. If we implement reasonable rules for staff reports, limit the number of staff reports, reasonably limit the time for staff reports with acknowledgement that some will, will you know, be hot ticket items and I think we all respect that. Um, and then with commendations, limit the number of commendations we have in council chambers um, uh, to whatever the, the number is, five a year, whatever it may be, so that they're really, really special. They're all special, but they're uniquely special uh, and, and whatnot. Um, then I, I, I think that'll do the job. 
And we also acknowledge that the, the Chairman Citro, whoever the chair will be at that time, will have a very difficult job in implementing it because it's, it, it's going to require in his or her part um, making sure that, that people keep in line to new rules, which is not easy. But I think a new, another council meeting, again, you're, you're at size 38 a year ago, you're at size 42 now, and that's buying size 46 pants. You're going to fill them up and you're going to be at size 48 before you know it. So, you know, I am there, man. So. I actually prefer the analogy of if you put another lane on the highway, it will be filled. Yeah. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so don't add another lane. Don't spend the money to add another lane. Uh, spend the money to figure out how to move it, move it more wisely. Uh, I just, um, you, you reminded me of a good point too, that if we move the staff reports to the afternoon, and then that way, the folks who are waiting can get that stuff done. If we do have a staff report that possibly goes a little bit longer, we have more, more wiggle room in terms of time, and we're not wasting the public's time. And I, I think that could also, hand in hand, really help. So thank you for that reminder. We did have that. We have the staff reports the afternoon. Oh, it did well. Ms. Shirley, I, w I, was, I had radio ear back when I was on my conference call. So one ear was from the conference call, one ear was this back. I thank you. I know that the expenditures and I know the, the staffing time are going to be a big drain on the city and your office, legal office. Uh, of course, we don't, let's not forget about IT. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget about everybody that's involved for putting on these meetings. However, we're a big city, and we better start having a big city mentality. Size 30, 40 and a 34, I like to say putting five, uh, 10 pounds of mud into a five pound sack. It just don't fit. We have several things we have to think about. Accommodations, if we do those to make people feel good. We have fire, we have police, we have uh, uh, ATU. That's their time. That's their time to shine. Uh, I, I would agree, if, if need be, to get the people that are out there waiting for their cases to be heard, to move them to the front, fine. I have no problems, but we need to change it in our rules and procedures. We can come up here and say, I want to, no, let's change. Don't circumvent the rules and procedures, change them. We also need to keep our discussions on what's at hand, and that is our agenda. Maybe instead of having five minutes for everybody to discuss something what's on our agenda, let's have it cut down to two minutes. That way we can keep our city moving, keep our agenda moving. I don't mind. I'm, I'm a full-time worker here. I'll spend seven days a week here. But I know that Ms. Shirley Fox Knoll is not going to want to do that. I know that IT is not going to do that. If we can condense our time so that we can stick to the agenda, I think we can shave a lot of time. Anybody else have any more comments, questions, acknowledgments? If I may, Mr. Chair, are we ending the meeting? No. Oh, okay. no. Okay. Sorry. Then no. I, I, I was. I'll say a word after that, but go uh, ahead. I was just going to say, do we need to make some sort of motion? Because if we do, Absolutely. let's do it. Well, if, you, uh, if the council's prepared for it, certainly. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, so, I, I would agree with you <clears> that <throat> the, the rules now state staff reports come before your 930 hearings. If it's council's pleasure to have them moved to the okay. afternoon, you could set them for the afternoon. And if they have to be moved up sooner, we've done that in the past. The chair we has made did that. Um, I, 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 and, and yes, I understand and, that, but let's, let's change the rules and procedures. Yeah, that's, and that's, that's fine. As a matter of fact, well, thank I'm going you. to be discussing that under new business. But the other thing is also the limits. Council, I will tell you, frankly, having a workshop agenda, for instance, what you have on the 23rd, or having the number of staff reports uh, coming up on February 2nd, you had talked about limiting the number of staff reports. And specifically, you had talked about the limits on individuals 
individual council members making in-person commendations. Same thing with presentations, though. Council members sometimes are asked by organizations to be able to come before council, and that turns in, and there's nothing to be, there's no judgment involved about this, but, but practically speaking, it engenders a conversation among the council members, and sometimes council members take several minutes apiece to be able to communicate about this organization or about what its accomplishments or what its goals are or what its city's relationship is. And that adds time to the meeting. So maybe uh, a, a reflection of, of being able to manage your time, and that is a very tough job of council because this council, yes, you have a five minute rule, but you also have a council that's very engaged in dialogue with each other and also <coughs> asking questions and getting answers, which then and that came up during the special discussion meeting, generate more comments from, from council members because it's the only opportunity you have to talk amongst yourselves and to hear what other council members' questions are and what the answers are. So it's a very difficult role that, that the chair has and it's a very, to be able to enforce these things, um, but I will certainly make the rules consistent with what council wants. You can actually, and I've read other um, jurisdictions' rules, some of them have, uh, do actually limit the number of, um, of, of, of commendations or staff reports and the like, so it's not unheard of, but the thing is, this council is also very um, accommodating to each other when motions are made. And the question then is then, if somebody wants to make an exception, for instance, even with a number of staff reports, something is very pressing to your constituents. It, you cannot wait till the next month to have that heard because it needs to be heard as soon as possible. So there are a lot, of, a lot of variables, as the chair had said, that go into this meeting, but I'm happy to, um, uh, to be able to make the rules consistent with what council's desire is, because once again, as I always say, it's your meeting. Council won't hurt that. Um, so I have a motion, I'll just try. We'll see how it goes. Um, I make a motion that, we, that um, uh, the city Council attorney, come back to us um, with changing the rules and the procedures, whatever we need to do, to require, to um, allow um, five minutes for special presentations at the beginning with five minutes additional for um, council comments. Only three 10 minute commendations, commendations for each meeting with no comments from council. And then to move no more than 10 staff reports after other city business has been finished. A second question. Question. Got some goods. Although I respect the motion, in reality, that's not going to happen. Because when you have accommodations, and you have police or fire up there, ATU, you have the presenter talking, you have the chief or fire chief giving information, then you have the actual recipient talking, then you have all of the folks that line up on that wall to give gifts and presentations. Five minutes would not be adequate, so I, I, I don't think you can put a time on how long the presentations of the accommodation would be because no matter what time you put, you could exceed that. Before, before you go, I, I, I agree with you. The presentations, in my opinion, are not what is all time consuming. I think we, we need to rein back on ourselves. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, that, that's a very good point. I believe someone in our special session even um, brought up the idea of those gifts being given um, afterwards, maybe downstairs in the sister city's room so that it's not something that we all have to sit through. Um, again, just, just in the interest of time, not in the interest of um, not uh, celebrating these, these folks, uh, but we really have to be able to um, rein it in um, so that we can get the city's business done, and having a whole nother day means more staff, means more all of this. So I would at least like to give it a try and see how it goes. Councilman Vieira. Um, you know, I, I'm gonna vote for whatever's out because I think that uh, Marty's gonna be talking with us. I, I, I don't think that it's wise to cut out the gifts. It's, it's literally probably three minutes. And, and, and again, and, and, I, and I respect the sentiments 110%, but I suggest in the interest of time, we move something forward. Mr. Shelby works on it. It comes back to us and, um, and he can talk to individual council members on what they like and then come back with something. So I'll vote with whatever. Are you whatever. seconding Councilwoman Hurtag? Yes. We have a motion made 
I, I agree with Councilman Goose. Time-wise, it, it's not gonna work. I mean, you can, in theory, it looks nice, but in application, it, it's not gonna work. I'm not gonna vote against it, but I'm telling you right now, then, not only that, first we had the, the managers and the department heads in the back of the, then they wanted to come to the front so they can go back to work. But by the time we get to them, they should have been at work. So it, it, we're, not, we're not facilitating what we said ourselves. I don't know how or why, but I'm wanting to try something to look at it, but I don't think it's going to work. I'm not trying to be pessimist in any way. <laughs> well, Just real factual. Okay. Councilwoman Hurtak. But can we at least agree that if we cut down our comments, we're cutting 10 minutes out? Uh, that's fine. I agree with that yes. part. Okay. All well, right. then, so we'll workshop it more, but at least we have something on paper. We're going to give it a work. All right, then. If, 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 if we, we're talking, we have a motion. Uh, Mr. Shelby will bring it back to us. He can discuss it with us individually. Any more comment on the motion? I didn't give a date. What date would work for you? March 2nd. Okay. March 2nd it is. Motion made by Councilwoman Hurtak, seconded by Councilman Vieira. All in favor? Aye. Is there any opposed? And after we're finished, Mr. Chair, may I say something really fast because I have to leave? Uh, hang, hang on one second. Yes, Let the record reflect that the motion has passed. Councilman Vieira. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I, I, I have to um, leave really fast. I have to give uh, actually a commendation that I have to, if I may, make a really quick motion for it. It's non controversial, really fast. I, it's funny, I wanted to um, uh, wait to do this until after filing was done because this gentleman was rumored to be filing for city council, so I didn't want to bring this forward. But it's the 10th anniversary of Sean Harrison's law firm, former state rep, former state city councilman. I was going to give him a commendation for 10 years. Uh, just that's it. A motion made by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? And that's not in person, that's off site. Oh, no. Off site? Right. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, what is this resolution that you yeah. have before? This is new business, so if you want to, it's, it's sort of like in line with what you're talking oh. about, but if you want me to bring it up yeah. now, it's like you're, or you went away from your own, <laughs> done with new business. What we'll do new business? Well, we still got inf we still have information reports. Let's go down the line. Information reports. Councilman uh, Miranda. Thank you, sir. I have two, sir. Thank you. One uh, on 119 of 22, an evening meeting, I made a motion to present a combination to Ms. Lydian Stringer for her retirement, 32 years of service at Tampa Housing Authority as Director of Public Relations. I would like to present that combination here on Council on February 7th of 23. We have a motion made by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman uh, Goods. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mur Miranda. Miranda, seconded no, by Councilman but Goods. But he, he's just the one that always does. All in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed? The, the second one, sir, it, we did this last year, and I, I, the, the young people that worked so, so hard to put this together, I would like to make a motion to present combination to Isabel, I think it's Becor, a senior at Academy holding name for winning the gold medal at USS Tampa Post Seven. 5 oratorical contest. Another combination to Emily Peaky, a sophomore at Cambridge Christian School for winning the silver medal for the USS Post number five rhetorical contest. To assist the students and their parents, I would like to make this presentation on the evening of February 9th, 2022. We did this last year and it exactly. takes no more than five minutes on each one. And the, the audience was so awed, they stepped up and gave a letter of ovation. It was good. Motion made by Councilman Miranda, seconded by Councilman Maniscalc. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. That's it, sir. Council Magoos, Councilwoman Hurtak. Yes, um, I would like to present a commendation to the Women's History Committee at the 26th annual, annual Women's Second. History Month celebration on March 1st, 2023. That will be offsite. And I will have you know, I have been with you all for nine months now. This is my first commendation. Second. Well, you got, you got two left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, and sorry, was that, was that offsite or was that in person? Offsite. Offsite. Motion made by Councilwoman Hurtak, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Councilman Maniscalco. I would like to make a motion to present a commendation to Tampa Pride at the regular session council meeting on March 16th in honor of their upcoming celebration on March 25th and for their continued service to the community. I was going to present it at the event, but they really wanted to have it done at that uh, regular session, but it'll be quick. Second. Motion made by Councilman Mascaco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. That's it. Councilman Carlson. I make a, uh, 
Councilman Miranda, you are uh, giving the proclamation to the crew of Santiago on behalf of the mayor. That's February 2nd, I believe. February 2nd. I would like to make a motion to present a commendation to the crew of Santiago during that proclamation proceedings on February 2nd. Yeah, I did that last year, too. We have a motion from the chairman. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Council Member Goose. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Anything else? No. That, now we're going to have to hear Mr. Shelby with this resolution about this resolution. This is a resolution amending the rules of procedure, um, specifically handling remote participation by council members. It includes now the um, uh, communications media technology for quasi-judicial. This will be able to save time by not having the guidelines. So moved. Wait, Second. wait, the, and wait, there's more. Um, it also um, includes quasi-judicial for qua um, um, uh, CMT um, for the general public and Importantly, it has the council's direction with request to continue bu public hearings that, that it'll be deemed uh, if a request is made, uh, it'll, and there's been two previous occasions, it will be deemed withdrawn and dismissed the petition unless waived to extraordinary and unavoidable circumstances that city council determines in its sole discretion. Something else that was added, no continuance shall be granted at a quasi-judicial public hearing after the petitioner or the applicant has completed its initial presentation. So you won't be in that position now of having to hear the whole thing be, and then have a petitioner request a continuance at the end because it'll be set out in the rules that they'll know that they want to do it. They have to do it up front, but they only get two bites. Two bites. And uh, that I'd like to have ask it to be added to next week's meeting so you can read it by title so we can have it begin to take effect after it's read at the next consecutive meeting. <coughs> so I'd like this on next week's so agenda moved. if possible. Yeah. A motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And if I hear no objection, we are at uh, motion received receive by. Second. Motion received by, by, by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Hurtak. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, we are recessed till 501.